back to the Vincent Griego Chambers. Feels really good to be back. And uh, so welcome everyone who's here. We are, uh, uh, we do have counselors and, and, and the key staff from the administration um, here with us tonight. And we hope someday in the near future we'll have the general public back with us. I uh, also want to welcome uh, back Officer G Gunderson from APD, who has historically been with us. I don't know if that, when I use the word history, does that mean we're old, Officer? <laughs> uh, but, but great to have him back. You know, he was, uh, in, he was uh, 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 injured in one of the high-profile uh, shootings up in the, in the Upper Heights, and uh, we're glad he came through well. And back with it, so thanks, officer. And I'll we'll go to a uh, roll call as far as uh, we're all here, so welcome all the counselors, including those who have never been up here before, Counselor Sanchez, Council, or Fable Corn, and Counselor Grout, so it's fun, it's much better being up here. <laughs> so welcome to you in that sense only, but um, um, so everyone is here. And we'll move on to the Pledge of Allegiance. And I'd like to ask uh, Counselor Sanchez to read it in English and Counselor Pena to read in Spanish. Thanks, Councillor Sanchez and Pena. As was noted in a press release from our office on Friday, posted on our website and noted in our published council agenda, this meeting has special procedures. This meeting is being held in the Vincent e. Griego Chambers and public participation is via Zoom. We welcome back the public to join us in the chambers at our April 4th meeting. Members of the public have the ability to view this meeting live through four different platforms, GovTV on channel 16, on Comcast channel 16, the GovTV website, YouTube, and Zoom webinar. These live streams can be accessed from most of your smartphones, tablets, or computers. Also, this meeting is closed captioned, and you may enable closed captioning uh, by turning it on your device or television at this time. For those watching on the live stream, thank you for joining us. The video recording of this and all past council meetings will remain available for viewing at any time on the City Council's website. Council staff is available to assist you via telephone uh, if you need help finding the videos, and you can call them at 505-768-3100 for assistance during business hours, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. The Council is accepting live public comments today via Zoom as well as written comments. Written comments received by 3 p.m. were distributed to the counselors in advance of tonight's meeting. Proclamations and presentations, we have none tonight, nor an economic development discussion, so we will go to general public comments now. Hello to those joining us to provide live general public comment. Uh, members of the public will be able to address the council if they have signed up for live public comment per the instructions published in the agenda and on our website Friday. Speakers will be moved into the meeting room two at a time. They will remain muted with their camera off until they are called upon to speak, at which point they can turn on their camera, unmute themselves, and will have two minutes to provide comments to the council. After that, they will again be muted and return to be an attendee on the Zoom webinar. Here are the public comment ground rules. Each participant, two minutes comments to be addressed to the counselors only through the council president. And then any disruptive conduct, of course, will be result in removal from the Zoom webinar. Mr. Moya, please call the name of our first speaker. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Kelly Cockrell. Kelly, please feel free to turn your video on, unmute yourself, and your two minutes will begin when you start speaking.
Ellie, one second. I think we're having some technical difficulties on this end. Give us one second. Kelly, can you try again one more time, please? Okay, yeah, we're having a difficulty. We're getting a technician in here to, to take a look at this for us. So please hold on. Thank you. Mr. Moy, I'm going to move on uh, to uh, some business, and then we'll get back to this whenever uh, we have it working. Thanks. Um, next is administration question and answer period. Counselors, any questions for the administration? Councillor Feeblecorn, you have Thank questions you, Mr. for Director Martinez, I believe. Yeah, I, um, so my questions were around the upcoming farmer's market season. I know that we have some issues around how that um, ordinance is written, and we don't want to charge people every single time that they're going to a farmer's market. I know that there's a long-term plan in place to fix that ordinance by next year, but I wanted to get on the record for folks to understand what's gonna happen this year for people that wanna participate in farmers markets around the city. Uh, thank you, Council President Benson, Councilor Feeblecorn. I'm gonna invite uh, Deputy Director Mark Demena up to answer this question from Environmental Health. Uh, thank you, uh, President Ben, Councilor Feeblecorn. Uh, we do have a process that we have <clears throat> excuse me, in place just for this year. Uh, since, as you say, we won't have a, a legislative fix in time. Uh, and essentially what that's going to look like is uh, we, we're going to have a, a variance process to allow the, the one permit for each market to go throughout the entire season. Um, any vendor will still have to apply to participate in, in the individual markets, um, but we'll mainly be handling that all on our end. So they would come, the vendor would come in uh, through the market organizers and fill out four applications if they're participating in four markets. And in exchange for that, they'll get a permit that is good throughout the entire season. Uh, the other concern with that was that there was going to be a compounding of fees on top of what the vendors are used to paying, and we don't want to do anything to discourage participation. So what that will actually be is uh, there's been a fee waiver that's been granted. Uh, so the all vendors will pay the 50. Sorry. I thought maybe that was just my voice. Is that better? Okay. Sorry about that. Um, if, I'm, if, if anything didn't come through, I can repeat whatever. Um, the... Uh, the $50 cap on the fee will correspond to what market vendors have paid traditionally in the past under the old MOU, um, which has some problems for us in terms of the way that it was set up. It doesn't correspond to our actual permitting. Um, so each vendor will still be able to participate in all of the markets throughout the entire year, and that will be a $50 cap. So even if they need multiple categories of permits or multiple permits across different markets, they'll only pay the $50 for this year. That is what the, uh, the ordinance that we're working on uh, to bring in front of you all will look like as well, so that we don't end up having a, just a, a, an accumulation of lots and lots of fees for people that want to participate in all of the markets. Thank you, Director Deme uh, Deputy Director Medina. Um, can you just tell me if that's going to be available on the website or somewhere in writing so that that process is understood? Yeah, President Ben, Councilor Feeblecorn, that's actually on our website as of today. Um, we wanted to make sure that we had all of the process behind the scenes worked out, um, in particular because we're tracking all of the vendors ourselves. We wanted to make sure we could track them, and we weren't going to create a worse situation through uh, lots of strings attached, but we have that all worked out internally, and now it's on the website as well. Um, in order to increase public awareness of that and our participants' awareness, we're also working on a press release uh, in conjunction with the market organizers to talk about how we're accommodating this year's season and just generally promote the idea of the markets. Thank you. That's all my questions, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. I had a, chief, a question for the for Chief Medina. Chief Medina, not here. Okay. The question that I have is um, in reference to a story that was done um, in reference to overtime that happened recently, and um, his quote was up here on the fifth floor the police department, the ex executive staff, we're so busy to go through the final details of looking through somebody's timesheets. It is not something that we're going to be carving out time for. Um, 
And that question I'm going to use as an example. Um, when I was a young police officer, my first sergeant, Buddy Whitson, told me that your timesheet is the single most important item that you deal with as a police officer every single day of the week and twice a week. That needs to be accurate, 100%. It's a legal document, so it has to be 100% accurate. And for the comment of uh, that we don't have time for that, that puts me in a position where you don't have time to do your job. So I needed to get an explanation as why we don't have time to do a timesheet and check timesheets um, from the administration. Council President Benton, Councillor Sanchez, um, we, we weren't uh, notified of your question in advance, so the chief isn't here, but uh, Lieutenant Roger Legendre is here and can answer those questions. President and members of council, um, with this question for Chief Medina, this is something that we'd uh, like to get back to you on and have him give an opportunity to have a proper response to you. Okay, and what's your name, sir? I apologize. My name is Roger Legendry, and I'm interim commander with the Operations Review Division. Lieutenant Legendry, I just wanted to ask you a question as well. Is the timesheet not the single most important item that you fill out every single two weeks for your paycheck, and it's a legal document and has to be uh, filled out properly? Absolutely, sir. And just like you were told when you were a young officer, I was told the same thing 17 years ago. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> uh, Councillor Pena has a question. Thank you, Mr. President. I don't know if this is the appropriate time in the agenda, but um, you know, um, as you all know, um, Ms. Sarita Nair has um, decided to move on in her career, and I just really wanted to take this opportunity because I, um, it's my understanding that this is her last meeting, um, her first meeting back, her last meeting, and I just want to say that I just really want to commend you, and really I have a lot of respect and admiration. Uh, of course, I've said this time and time again, you know, this is National Women's Month, and, you know, being a, a woman of color and the first woman of color that's the CAO of the city of Albuquerque, you know, there's a lot of young girls um, out there that really could look to you as, as a role model. You know, I know I've talked to lots of people from different departments, and um, APD in particular, just saying how much you have helped with the DOJ process, your understanding and your thoughtfulness during this whole process that a, a lot of them felt that they could rely on you and had confidence that you guys were really making some, some institutional change. Um, I just really appreciate that because I know sometimes, um, you know, um, what the public sees and, and, and what it takes to really make the necessary change to turn APD around doesn't happen overnight and it really takes somebody to roll up their sleeves and, and get that job done and I really appreciate the work that you've done to do that, you know, and um, just in terms of the departments and, you know, with the um, with the TRIA Center, I keep calling it the TRIA Center, the Gateway Center, you know, just knowing that, you know, that work is probably when we talk about public safety, for me, that is paramount and that is what's most important is making sure that we address the underlying issues in our community and attack the root causes. And again, that is something that takes time to get done. So I just want to say how much I really appreciate you, the work you've done, and I wish you well in your future endeavors. Councilor Lewis. Mr. President, I, I, I just want to make a, a comment that, um, and I want, to, I want to lift up the expectation that during this uh, question and answer time for the administration that um, I, I, don't, I don't think the expectation should be that, there, uh, that we notify you all of any kind of questions that we might have for this meeting. I think the expectation should be that there might be any question from this council and uh, uh, the administration needs to be ready, um, whether it be department directors need to be here and available for this meeting. Um, and the administration certainly needs to be ready to answer any and all questions that we might have during this time. That's what this time is for. Um, but I certainly don't want the expectation at all to be the fact that if we don't notify you of any questions ahead of time, um, that, that, uh, that, that somehow um, we get to pass those off till the next meeting. So. Um, Mr. President, I, I, we need to, I think we need to uphold that expectation at this meeting. Thank you for that, that point, uh, Councillor, and I agree. Um, 
I do always encourage counselors that if you do know what your question is going to be, to get, give the administration advance notice so that, that uh, we can get the best possible answer, answer for you on the spot. Uh, but at the same time, uh, yeah, I, I do agree. I think, you know, um, uh, with everything you said, really, um, and, and I don't know if there's exceptions in the director's positions that were, you know, we could have a discussion about that, but I think we know which ones are commonly, um, you know, there are questions for, and, and we certainly want them to be here, but, but uh, I hear you. And that, that has been the tradition in the past that the department directors are here. And, uh, but I can assure you that we can also discuss about scheduling and, you know, the, uh, we've, we've had some interactions with regard to the, to the uh, uh, our, our, uh, our agenda order of, of business. And um, so we want to be respectful of everyone's time, but we also do when uh, this is only twice a month and the public is here, they do need to be able to, where, wherever possible, uh, you know, get, get an answer at that time from those who are responsible for the respective departments. So thank you. Uh, uh, Councillor Sanchez, you had another question. Thank you, Mr. President. It's also another comment or suggestion, I guess you should say, but uh, something that we think is very important um, going on with our city, and that is the uh, issue of crime. Uh, this weekend, we had several issues that popped up, and it's particularly in my district where a four-year-old was shot in the foot at Pat Hurley Park. And um, we also had the stabbing on the uh, rail runner, and then um, an officer saw a man walking around uh, Tramway and Central with a gun. All these things are going on in our city, and I think it's indicative of the uh, administration, the police department, the police chief, to make sure that they keep us apprised every single meeting, and including um, the Public Safety Committee, of what's going on in reference to our, our numbers, our manpower, how many officers are assigned to field services, when field services is, 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 has gone down in manpower, when it's gone up in manpower, I think it's very important that the citizens and the city council know um, on a, at least a two-week basis um, where we stand in reference to recruiting, if there's any new classes coming in. Um, all of these things are very, very important to the citizens of Albuquerque and the last every single meeting that I've been on and watched, none of these things uh, have ever come up. So I'd really, really like to um, see if we can make that as a standing um, position on our meeting so that we can know um, what's going on. I'd really like to see some sort of accountability matrix as we move forward in terms of are we doing what we need to be doing to get more officers on the street and boots on the ground. And that's to answer calls for service, the 911 calls, not um, 36, um, ad 36 administrators or politically appointed people that are in the police department right now. That's all I've got to say. All right. Any other questions for the administration? Seeing none, I just uh, wanted to echo uh, comments from Councillor Pena and pre appreciation of, of Ms. Nair. She's, uh, she's a very fine professional and has been a, um, a great representative of the city as, as the, the number two in the pecking order here. So thank you, Sarita, for all your work. Um, We'll move on to uh, the journal, Count Vice President Lewis. Mr. President, I move the approval of the March 7th journal. There's a motion and a second. Uh, we can vote by hand now, right? But good old days, all right? All those, <laughs> are, all those in favor, say yes. Opposed? That passes unanimously. I think we're ready now for general public comment, Mr. Moya. Thank you, Mr. President. If we can have uh, Kelly try again, please. No, I'm sorry, Kelly. Hold on one second. Doesn't seem like we're having the same issue here. All right, counselors, we're going to move on and 
sorry, ma'am. Thanks for staying with us, and we'll try to get you uh, your audio working for us so that we can hear you. Apologies. Um, let's see now. We'll move to communiques communications and introductions. Are there any changes to the letter of introduction? Uh, seeing none, Vice well, President. Mr. President, move approval of the letter of introduction. And a second from Councillor Grout. Uh, and all those in favor, say yes. Yes. Opposed. And that passes unanimously. Um, we'll now move to reports of committees, starting with Councillor Davis. Thank you, Mr. President. The Finance and Government Operations Committee met on Monday, March 14th, and reported out the following items. In the matter of ECs 28, 29, 30, 30 31, and 32, 32 that they be approved, approved in the matter of 8, 8, 8, 8, 11, and 27, they received the matter And in the matter of in the matter of matter of matter of matter of matter of in the matter of 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 the matter we have a motion and, and a second. And second. All those in favor? Say yes. Opposed? 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 Pass. 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 Uh, Councillor Sancho. 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 The Public Safety public Committee public met on Tuesday, Tuesday, March 15th and reports out the following items. In the matter of the matter of the matter of the matter matter of the 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 Opposed? 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 That passes. That passes. passes. Councillor Jones. 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 Thank you, Mr. Thank President. You, Mr. President. The Land Use the land Planning and Zoning Committee met on Wednesday, Wednesday March 16th, 16th and, reports and reports out the following, out the following items. items. In the matter, in the matter of R8, R8, that it that do pass. pass. I make a motion make a to accept motion the committee report. report. Yes. Yes. Mr. President, 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 move up, move up approval, approval, of approval of the consent agenda. Consent agenda. Looks like we may like now we be uh, ready, uh, ready for public general public comment. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. You, President. Okay, okay, Kelly Cockrell, Cockrell if we can have you try again, try please. Again, please. Hello. Great, can you, you can hear you now. Hear you now. Mm -hmm. Your two right. minutes will begin when you start speaking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, first of all, can, um, to councilors uh, Feeblecorn, Davis, and Benton, thank you so, so much for watching out for the people of Albuquerque and refusing to bow to Councillor Bassan's attempt at keeping Albuquerque trashed with litter and plastic from a couple of weeks ago when you all voted for the plastic ban repeal. Uh, Councillors Renee Grout, Dan Lewis, Trudy Jones, Clarissa Pena, Louis Sanchez, and Brooke Passan. So six of you voted to repeal the plastic bag ban before the city was able to complete the study on the ban's impact. You listened to hours of testimony from people and businesses who wanted you to not repeal the ban and you did not care what the public asked you to do. What you're telling the citizens of Albuquerque is that you really don't care that our city gets trashed by the litter and plastic. You don't care that plastic bags are clogging our rivers and streams. And no counselors, recycling bags will not solve our plastic problem. Only 7% of single use bags actually get recycled. Plastic is forever. Here's the deal counselors, whether or not you like it, this is the direction that the world is going and you can try and stop the ban, 
for now and keep Albuquerque in the 20th century. But the truth is plastic bans do work. Data shows that when plastic bag bans are in place, people become more aware of their plastic consumption and reduce their consumption. Albuquerque will eventually ban the plastic bag. It may take several years, but it will happen whether you're on the council or not. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, our next speaker is, is Ashley, Ashley McKenna. McKenna. Ashley, Ashley, McKenna. McKenna. Ashley, 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 please feel free to turn your video on. 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 Video on.
we had a very tragic accident and we lost one of our second grade boys, Pranoy Bahacharya, at the River of Lights. He was hit by um, a drunk UTV driver. Um, and after that, uh, it just really feels like the ball has been dropped and that nothing has been done to protect the safety of our children. Um, and so I would like to address the fact that our community is still grieving over this child. Um, and plus, we also know that there's going to be the possibility of an increase of foot traffic near the biopark over the summer, especially with the new um, shop center that is that has in the area. And so I would just like to um, just really push the idea that there needs to be something done um, in that area to make sure that our children are safe, that our families are safe, um, and not to forget what happened to Pranoy, because um, I know that we sure won't. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Julian, I would like to. I'd like to I'd speak like to, to that to just that. briefly. Same here, same here, same here, same here. Same here. Same my district, my district, my district, 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 okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You have an echo in here. Um, um, the, 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 the tragic the accident, accident that the, that the uh, speaker, speaker uh, referred, uh, referred to um, um, occurred, uh, uh, as people know, um, essentially right at Tingley Drive in Central. That segment, and the big curve there uh, that, that leads into that if you're coming uh, eastward. Uh, just from observation is clearly uh, the speeds are well in excess of the posted speed limit of 30 miles an hour. I want to commend uh, our area commander and, uh, and APD uh, Deputy Chief Brown for Taking this very seriously, um, but we can't enforce our way entirely out of this. I think we need some design changes with that segment. Um, I don't know what exactly what they are. I'm not a transportation engineer, but I play one on TV, and I think we better um, take a hard look at it. Uh, some folks in, in um, the adjacent neighborhoods have said maybe we need a speed table at the intersection of New York. Um, I think any and all uh, methods to slowing down traffic, we know it's everywhere. That's just, this is not the only place, but this is the location where this occurred. And, and I think um, we need to look at it through design and continue enforcement. Just, just my two cents worth on that issue. And, and uh, yeah, it was a tragedy. And um, I think everyone shares uh, the sense of importance in trying to prevent these. Mr. President, Mr. President, 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 I also have, I also have wanted, to wanted to see if there's, if there's anything, anything that, that uh, can be done as an immediate as an remedy right, right now. Is there right anything, anything that the administration, administration can do to do something, do something um, right, right now, like, now, like maybe, maybe um, lower the speed, speed limit speed signs, speed signs, signs, maybe add signs, signs that say congested signs, area, signs, um, those kinds of things just to help out with the calming of the traffic right now so that we're getting into springtime now. And there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be crossing the street back and forth. Um, and I just want to make sure that uh, we don't have any other issues out there. So if there's something that the administration can do as a, an immediate fix while we do the study, that would definitely help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Thanks for that support. We'll move on to the next speaker. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilor Bassan. Thank you, Mr. President. I know that I've know been that in contact been with Ms. Humphrey quite, quite, quite a bit. Quite a bit. She, has, she has some activity, some activity over at Georgia O'Keefe Elementary, 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 which is in District, in District 4, 4, and then we've been in communication with you, Mr. Mr. President. President. Uh, I know uh, that, I know we've, that we've, we're, we're, working we're working on it, and so I ask our staff, Mr. Molina and Ms. Emilio, if you can work on getting us a meeting out by that area. I know that Ms. Humphrey has been asking several times for the counselors to meet with her so that we can make sure to find some kind of resolution with this. So I hope that she hears back. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, is it is taken very, taken very seriously, seriously, and, uh, and uh, you know, it, 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 it was it was, it was a known, known problem, problem prior to prior this, to and we have to just stay after it. After it. Um, I appreciate her, her speaking, speaking tonight. tonight. Anyone, else? Anyone else? Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Next, speaker. next speaker. Thank you, Mr. President. Our next speaker is Connie Monahan. Connie, please feel free to turn your video on, unmute yourself, and your two minutes will begin when you start speaking. 
Good evening, people. Thank you very much. My name is Connie Monahan. I'm the executive director of Albuquerque SANE, the Sexual Assault Nurse Examiners. And I've already written my accolades on behalf of Sarita that's submitted in writing, but there was a key point I wanted to make sure I convey. Um, and that is, it was the work from a lot of people, yourself included, the city council, the mayor's office and APD, as well as the nonprofits in this work um, that fixed the problem of the untested sexual assault kits. Um, that is fixed in Albuquerque. Um, Councilman um, Isaac Benton and Pat Davis, your initiatives are still happening. We're moving forward. Um, Sarita and the mayor both gave us attention um, they listened to us when we had problems. And then APD, I'm, I'm probably the only person in Albuquerque that speaks well of APD, but their sex crimes is doing an incredible job on a lot of work. Albuquerque tested like over 5,000 kids and the problem has not repeated. So I wanted to say thank you. I hope I have another good relationship with the next uh, chief officer. Um, and if you have any questions or problems or need more information about sexual assault in Albuquerque, we're doing the work and um, we're serving patients and thank you for supporting our work. That's it. Thank you. Mr. President, we had a, a handful of other folks sign up to speak, but they had not uh, attended the meeting for general public comments. So that will conclude general public comments. Thank you, Mr. Moy. And, uh, you know, this is our first time back in the council, so apologies for the technical difficulties. I did get a, uh, a text uh, that it's hard for, for uh, uh, them to hear uh, the, council the council online. online. Um, that was whenever, that was uh, three minutes ago. Anyway, we'll, we'll keep shaking this out and uh, keep improving it. This is our first, first run at it. We'll move to announcements. Um, Next, uh, uh, announces uh, Councillor Bassan. Thank you, Mr. President. There will be an Albuquerque Bernalillo County Government Commission plus APS meeting on Thursday, March 24th at 5 p.m. via Zoom. Councillor Jones. Not looking, Mr. President. I can. The, <laughs> the Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee met on Wednesday, March 15th and reports out the following item. In the oh, matter. No. Councillor. Councilor, this was the uh, announcement of the upcoming meeting. I'll, I am so I'll read sorry. it for Please you. Please do because yeah. I am lost. That's okay. Got okay. it. Okay. There will be a land use planning and zoning committee meeting on Wednesday, the 30th, March 30th at 5 p.m. in these Vincent Riego chambers. Public participation for this meeting will be via Zoom. Uh, and uh, that is our announcements. We'll move to public hearings. Um, and this first one is AC 2117, Modrell Sperling Law Firm, agent for Columbus Pacific Properties Limited, it appeals a decision of the Development Review Board. This matter has been withdrawn by the applicant. I make a motion to accept the withdrawal. Second. There's a motion from Councillor Feeblecorn. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed. Opposed. And that passes. Next is Item B, under public hearings, this is AC 21-1, Hessel Eintem of the third law firm, PA, agent for Karen Baer and others set out in the appeal application, appeals the decision of the Development Review Board. And uh, Councilor Bassan, the, uh, you're recusing in, on this matter. Yes, Mr. President, and just for the record, I believe you might have said AC 21-1 and it's AC 22-1. Oh, and I Due to my, no, that's okay. Uh, uh, but due to my uh, quite a bit of involvement way before I was on the council, I'm going to recuse myself from this matter. All right, thank you, Councillor. And uh, uh, Ms. Coladon is going to explain this appeal. considering your land use hearing officer's recommendation. The issue in this appeal is whether to remand a site plan approval to an independent hearing officer for a complete rehearing following alleged deficiencies in a court-ordered DRB remand hearing held on December 3rd, 2021. The DRB determined that the site plan should be approved because it satisfies all of the requirements of the IDO 
individual neighbors and neighborhood associations appealed the approval. The approved site plan is for a 93 dwelling unit apartment facility at the corner of Alameda and Barstow, located in Council District 4. This appeal specifically concerns procedural issues at a court-ordered DRB remand hearing. Uh, this appeal has a lengthy history um, with this matter being appealed and remanded to the DRB three times due to alleged issues in its hearing processes. The first DRB hearing was held in 2019 in which the site plan was approved and subsequently appealed. The LUHO remanded the matter back to the DRB for a new hearing uh, that complied with due process requirements. The second DRB hearing was held in 2020 and the site plan was again approved by the DRB and appealed. The LUHO recommended the appeal be denied and the council accepted that rec uh, recommendation. Following the council's denial of that appeal, the appellants appealed to the second judicial district court who found that procedural issues have persisted and the court concluded that the DRB's hearings were not in accordance with the law and must be remanded for an additional quasi-judicial hearing with specific instructions for the DRB to make explicit findings backing up its decisions. The third court-ordered DRB hearing was held on December 3rd, 2021. The DRB again approved the site plan and appellants filed the appeal before you today. The LUHO determined that the matter must again be sent back for another rehearing of the entire site plan application. The necessity of this remand stems from failures of the DRB to satisfy what the court clearly required of it in the court's remand order. Uh, the LUHO found a number of procedural deficiencies in the third remand hearing uh, in violation of the court's order and due process requirements. And the LUHO also found the DRB failed to fully address and explain its findings as instructed. Um, rather than exercising his authority to directly remand this case to the DRB to rehear this matter uh, once again, the LUHO recommends that the city council remand this case to an independent hearing officer for a rehearing. Uh, the LUHO also recommends consolidating the prior appeal records in this matter. Um, and a couple of other things to note um, is that the LUHO's recommendation focuses on procedural deficiencies uh, alleged uh, by the appellants uh, relative to the DRB's hearing process, not specific substantive questions related to the actual um, IDO approval criteria for the site plan. Um, some of the appellants submitted written comments to the council, um, the majority of which are in agreement with the LUHO's recommendation to refer this matter to an independent hearing officer. Uh, two of the appellants that submitted written comments disagreed, but their rationale was focused only on the fact that this development just should not be approved at all, regardless of the hearing procedures uh, utilized. Um, and uh, city staff has already arranged for an independent hearing officer for this specific case in the event that the city council follows the LUHO's recommendation. Um, and finally, this is an accept or reject, so the council's options are to accept the LUHO's recommendation with or without adopting any different findings, which would send this matter to an independent hearing officer, or council can reject the LUHO's recommendations, in which case this would get sent back to the DRB for a fourth rehearing, or council could hold a full hearing on the matter. Thank you, Ms. Kuladon. Are there questions for Ms. Kuladon? for that. Um, so we do have the three options before us. Is there a motion? Mr. President, I'd make a motion to accept the LUHO recommendations and findings. All right, and there's a second from Councilor Grout, thank you. So there's a motion to accept the LUHO recommendations and findings, and this will uh, send the, uh, the matter to an independent hearing officer opposed to back to the DRC. So um, all those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Opposed? Opposed? And that passes. You know. <coughs> Councilors, uh, we're, there's still audio difficulties in the room, and uh, I'm guilty too, so try to uh, make sure your microphone and, and staff as well when you speak at the, at the, at the lectern uh, to have your microphone uh, as directly as possible 
so that you can speak into directly into it. Thank you. Uh, we don't have any approvals tonight. We do have final actions, and we will uh, start with Councillor Bassan, 012. Oh, she's not back yet. Take your time. Thank you, Mr. President. Hang on. O12 is approving a project involving Pajarito Powder, LLC, pursuant to the Local Economic Development Act and City Ordinance to support the leasing, renovation, and improvement costs for a renewable energy technology company and catalyst manufacturing facility located in Albuquerque. I move it to pass. Good evening, Council. We propose uh, that uh, Pajito Powder LLC is seeking uh, the city of Albuquerque to be the fiscal agent for a state leader fund for the acquisition and construction of a catalyst manufacturing facility. Uh, Pajito Powder was uh, approved for 250000 in state leader funds and seeking 25000 from the city in leader funding for the project. The project will create 51 new jobs. Mr. Chavez will outline a little bit more. Okay, um, can you hear me okay? So uh, the ordinance would allow for reimbursement of approved project costs uh, that uh, Pajarito Powder can undertake, uh, so they can undertake the acquisition and construction for its new manufacturing facility. Uh, the company makes catalysts for uh, fuel cells, um, and as Tr Director Ashley said, they're gonna hire 51 new employees. They're a current Albuquerque company um, they're going to move from one their current location to a larger um, location. So the total new payroll over 10 years will be $3.47 million. Um, they're going to maintain the project for at least 10 years. And um, they expect uh, the uh, facility to be fully operational by the end of 2022. Um, overall, the city will receive a, an economic impact of over $471,000 over the 10-year period. Um, this is a qualified project under the state's LIDA statute and the city's enabling legislation. Um, and based on the above findings, the staff recommends the approval of uh, Pajarito Powder's uh, legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, we're going to hear from Pajarito Power via Zoom, uh, Thomas Stevenson and Webb Johnson. Mr. President, members of the council, uh, thank you for the opportunity to address you. I think the the project, um, you know, you have, have a summary. One of the things I'll say is that we are a homegrown New Mexico business. Uh, we were started here in Albuquerque in 2012. Uh, we've been very excited about our growth. It's been supported with investment both locally uh, and increasingly internationally, including a major investment that we received from Hyundai Motor Company of Korea last year. And this is going to give us the opportunity to be able to expand our facilities uh, and continue to service our customer base, which constitutes customers that are from around the world. Uh, in fact, the, the vast majority of our customers are actually outside of the United States. So we're a net exporter of activity uh, of our products to, uh, to other countries in Europe, uh, in Korea and Japan. Uh, and in South America. And you know, we continue to be very excited about the prospects for our growth here in our hometown of Albuquerque. And we very much appreciate the consideration uh, for the LIDA funding, both in support for being the fiscal agent for the state's program uh, and the additional compliment from, from the city of Albuquerque as well. Mr. Johnson, 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 Johnson. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Johnson, you, Johnson, you, Johnson, you, Johnson, you Johnson, 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 Johnson. My apologies. I, uh, I, I don't have any additional comment. All right. Thank you. Also wishing to speak in support of Pajarito, we have Danielle, Danielle Casey, 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 Casey of Albuquerque Regional Economic Alliance. 
Danielle, Danielle. Good evening, President Fenton and city councilors. Simply want to echo support for this project and uh, hopefully congratulations for their expansion and this additional investment in the market. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, we have Max Gruner from our state Econ economic development department. President Benton, councillors, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm having some challenges with the sound, so let me just say very quickly and to the point, we are absolutely thrilled to be able to support this company, this homegrown company through state leader funds. And I just want to extend my uh, most heartful, uh, heartfelt thanks to the city economic development department for serving as a fiscal agent for the state funds. And I, of course, will stand for any questions. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you. Mr. Gruner. And counselors, we do have the Economic Development Department Bond Council, Chris Muirhead, available on Zoom to answer any questions from the council. Are there any questions from Mr. Muirhead? Mr. President, my apologies. He's, he's actually in attendance. Oh, he's in attendance here. Any questions? He's right here in person. Yay. Um, uh, any questions for Mr. Muirhead? Councillor Davis. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Oh, okay, well, my mic works. I don't know if yours does. Uh, Mr. President, uh, thank you so much. And I thank you, Councillor Brisson, for bringing us. And thank you to the administration, Director Ashley. I think this is your first leader project that you've brought yes. to us. First time I've been here in 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. You're bringing good news. That's great. Um, just don't come, don't, don't be one of those to come back for the, the other Q and A part. Um, no, thank you so much. And I, I wanted to say some of us at the finance and government operations committee, got to hear a little more in depth and a little more time, which we don't want to extend today. Uh, but I do want to acknowledge and say thank you to the folks at Parito. Um, and as I think uh, Mr. Gruner pointed out, this is one of those companies that sort of used all of the tools in the toolbox from the very beginning as a New Mexico small company startup. Uh, things like LIDA, job training programs, uh, small business startup grants that became how to go to the next level grants, whatever those are called. Um, and really has taken advantage of been a partner with the state and with the city and their growth. Um, and quite frankly, this is another company. Just always want to make this point, Mr. President, and you're always so good to do this as well. Um, this is another company investing in what works best in New Mexico. This is renewable energy. This is our future. This is what uh, our technology is about. This is about supporting the next wave of energy uh, transition in our, our city and our state. And Council Brisson, congratulations for having another great business in your district. And, uh, and thanks to this council and the administration for working with them. And thanks to Mr. Gruner and his team as well. All right. Any other comments or questions? Uh, does the administration have any further comment? Then back to Councillor Bassan. Thank you, Mr. President. I don't think I can say it much better than Councillor Davis did, so I urge your support. All right. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say yes and raise your hand. Opposed? And that passes unanimously. Thank you. Next, we have. Councillor Bassan and myself, 014, establishing a business improvement district Mr. to be known okay. as the Albuquerque Sorry. Tourism Marketing District. Mr. 013, Mr. President. Oh, I'm sorry. Hang on. Oh, I beg your pardon. Uh, item B is 013, Councillor Bassan. Thank you, Mr. President. 013 is approving a project involving Aspen and Autumn LLC pursuant to the Local Economic Development Act and City Ordinance to support the acquisition, construction, and improvement of a warehouse and office facility for distribution of New Mexico-related foods and tourist items, which facility will be located in Albuquerque. I move a due pass. Second from Councillor Grout, I believe. And uh, uh, proceed. Please. Then we have we do have a some same group of people uh, uh, starting with uh, economic development staff Charles Ashley and then Chris Chavez. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Aspen and Autumn has been approved for seven hundred fifty thousand in state leader funds, and they're seeking two hundred fifty thousand in city leader funds for a project. Uh, not to mention that the fact that the company is growing, they committed to hiring and retaining at least seventy one employees. Uh, as outlined in our project participation agreement. And uh, Mr. Chavez will break down a little bit more of the company. Uh, 
Okay, um, so Aspen and Autumn is composed of two businesses with uh, partial joint ownership. Uh, they specialize in wholesale, wholesale distribution of goods. Uh, so the two companies are BSR Distributing and Fresh Picks Distribution. Uh, BSR, uh, generally known as Blue Sky Distributors, is a wholesaler of food, drink, uh, and alternative items to grocery stores and convenience stores and retail outlets throughout the Western United States. Um, Fresh Picks um, is also a wholesaler, but uh, they specialize in supplements, dietary products, uh, counterculture products, and ancillary goods and services. Um, Fresh Picks also specializes in a largely out-of-state sales model that uh, distributes uh, New Mexico products nationwide, which is uh, both of these companies, they distribute New Mexico products um, all throughout the Southwest and United States. So um, it also helps other businesses, or also uh, helps other New Mexico businesses. Um, neither company engages in retail sales directly to consumers. Uh, both these projects, past uh, finance and um, the Albuquerque Development Commission unanimously. Um, so the total anticipated uh, payroll over 10 years is going to be 7.5 million, um, and it's a qualified project under the state Salida statute and the city's enabling legislation. Um, and based on the above findings, staff recommends approval of Aspen and Autumn Salida project. Thank you. Thank you. And Max Gruner, we have you up to speak as well again. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, once again, I uh, just want to thank the Council for its consideration and thank the City of Albuquerque's Economic Development uh, Department for its ongoing partnership. Uh, we are absolutely thrilled about supporting um, uh, this business, Aspen Autumn. And uh, as uh, Council Bassam has, has pointed out, uh, one of the aspects of this, this particular project is the uh, downstream effects that this project will have on small agricultural and food businesses in New Mexico. You know, we have so many smaller businesses that are wondering, how do I get my product on the shelf? And Aspen Autumn is, is perfectly positioned to really have an impact in that space. So again, I, I thank you for your consideration of this project. Thank you, sir. And we have Aspen Autumn. And uh, Mr. Brian Thomas to speak. Not okay. All right. Uh, any questions for Mr. Muirhead? Councillor Pena. Mr. President, I was just wondering. I think I may have gotten this question answered at the last meeting, but I don't recall. What's the average pay for these jobs? Um, Mr. President, uh, Councillor, which uh, project? For, for this. For Aspen and Autumn? Yes. Uh, one moment. Average pay, starting pay. Thank you for getting that. My apologies, it's gonna take just one moment. Uh, 63,000. 63,000, wow, that's pretty good. So I just wanna say, I know it's in close proximity to my district, it's also fall, it actually falls in Council Sanchez's district. So I'm really excited and encouraged to see something like this coming to the area and the fact that it has uh, decent paying jobs, much appreciated, thank you. Councilors, any other questions? Uh, Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, I, I'm off easy tonight. I think Mr. Gruner said it very eloquently as well. So thank you very much. I urge your support. All right, there's a motion and a second. All those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Yes. And that passes unanimously. Um, all right, we'll now move to where I was last, ben, Councilor Benton and Bassan, 014, establish a business improving, uh, establishing a business improvement district to be known as the Albuquerque Tourism Marketing District. I move a due pass. Second from Councilor Bassan. 
And uh, we do have an individual sign up to speak. Mr. Moya, please call their name. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we have Rhiannon Samuel. Uh, Rhiannon, please feel free to turn your video on, unmute yourself, and your time will begin when you start speaking. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, President Benton and members of the council. My name is Rhiannon Samuel, and I represent NAOP New Mexico, the Commercial Real Estate Development Association for the whole state. Many of my members are partners to this industry by developing, building, financing, and designing lodging options and hotels. Our membership stands in support of O2214. We applaud the lodgers and the hoteliers community. And there are many partners for this creative and innovative, innovative solution. We know that for guests of our beautiful city and state that their visit is often similar to a first date and it can lead to economic development and in migration. We must put our best foot forward and in this uh, interaction and this assessment will help us fund a visitor and hopefully a business pipeline. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We do have several other individuals joining us this, easy, easy, this evening to address questions that we may have. We'll start with a brief presentation from Ms. Tanya Armenta, the President and CEO of Visit Albuquerque. Good evening, Councilor, Council President Benton and members of the council. Pleased to be with you again this evening, and I'm going to do a quick recap. If I'm able to share my screen, just one moment. You should now be viewing my screen. I'm going to do just a, re a quick recap from the last time we were together for the January 19th meeting. Uh, again, just uh, Albuquerque Tourism Marketing District, very much a game changer for our city's economic vitality. It says that my screen sharing is paused. I just wanna make sure that you all are able to see it. Yes, we yes, can. We yes, can. Yes, can. Yes, okay, great. Okay, so this evening, a quick recap from the January 19th meeting, describing why this additional funding is necessary to compete and the capacity for it. Describe how it will work and how it will benefit our Albuquerque's economic recovery. Review the Albuquerque Tourism Marketing District Plan. And then you'll um, have an opportunity to hear comments from the planning group and answer any questions that you might have. So again, at the January 19th, uh, your action um, and your support approved this planning group, Kanan Harris from Heritage Hotels and Resorts, Depeche Kolwadwala from Sun Capital Hotels, Damon Kompanowski from the Sheridan Uptown, who also happens to be the president of the Greater Albuquerque Hotel and Lodging Association, Prakash Sundram from Total Management Systems, along with myself. Um, your, that action on January 19th approved this group. It also um, approved the city clerk to notice all properties that are in the proposed district of the public hearing that would take place. This public hearing was held on February 22nd of this year. The district plan was reviewed at that public hearing and public comment was received. Upon after the hearing, the planning group came back together to finalize the district plan. It is submitted to you along with the ordinance uh, for, for uh, action this evening. So again, a quick recap of why we this funding is necessary. Here's just how the current lodger's tax allocation and hospitality fee collections work. Um, state statute says at least 50% has to be spent to market the city as a tourism destination. In our case, 50% of our lodger's tax and hospitality fee is allocated to debt service. So that means no more than 50% can be allocated to marketing and promotions. Currently, Visit Albuquerque receives about 42%, receives 42%, excuse me, of the lodger's tax and hospitality fee collected by the city. So you'll see that there is a uh, capacity, there is a ceiling there. And this is one of the reasons that the hotel industry, the lodging industry came together to provide this innovative solution for, to supplement this funding. So a tourism marketing district uh, provides fully dedicated ongoing source of revenue for tourism promotion. It's a business coalition that allows the pro lodging properties to organize their efforts to, uh, excuse me, uh, for the, okay, 
Hold on one second. Sorry about that. Just making sure you can still see my screen. Something seemed to take over. Um, yeah, uh, Mr. Moyes uh, got the control over the screen, over the screen I think, at this point. Yes. It's a fu fu fully funded, um, dedicated to the promotion for tourism promotion. It's a business coalition that allows lodging properties to organize their efforts, which in turn attracts more visitors to Albuquerque. And it's a powerful economic development tool that generates revenue and creates jobs. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, the T how it will work, a 2% assessment on gross room rental revenue at the lodging properties located within the district. The fee is paid by the guest at checkout and collected by the lodging properties and the lodging properties maintain control of their advertised room rates. Next. So the question, um, you know, why now? Um, and very much we are, um, as you know, for the last two years, very, very challenging um, environment for the hospitality industry over the last two years. We are starting to see recovery, but it's going to be a highly competitive environment. And the truth is that um, many of our um, competitors are much, um, they have just have significant funding in comparison to our destination to, uh, to really stay competitive and to be competitive. So on the next slide, you'll see just a, a reminder of where we sit today in terms of the dollars dedicated to um, tourism marketing. And I will point out that the 6.5 million that's listed for uh, Visit Albuquerque or for Albuquerque is both our public and private funding uh, that comes from our partnership. Um, so just an example, uh, again, reminding you that those top cities, there's, a, there's one carrot listed to, the, to those four top cities. They've already done what we're discussing today in creating a tourism marketing district, tourism improvement district. The cities that are listed with two carrots are actively um, discussing this. There is a pro um, proposal um, in, or it's in development for something very similar to this. So you can see those top four destination, you know, at least four times the budget that Albuquerque has. Um, competitors like Oklahoma City and Phoenix more than double our budget. And even Tucson and Santa Fe, um, for example, are almost double the budget that Albuquerque has to, to market the destination. So just an example of why this is needed to compete for Albuquerque. Moving along in terms of then the capacity to do this, um, as we look to the, to the next slide, we'll look at uh, the capacity to, to do this. This is where the tourism marketing district concept comes from. This is 193 cities have implemented what we're discussing today, tourism marketing district or tourism improvement district. Um, so you can see that trend line uh, um, rapidly growing in terms of this um, approach to a dedicated tourism, tourism uh, funding. On the next slide, you'll see that um, this is the capacity that we have for these guest fees. Um, this is not that I, I've mentioned at the last council meeting, San Antonio is not the top of the funnel. I'm aware of cities that have as high as 21% upon guest checkout fees. Um, but just to give you an idea, we are at 13.875 right now. You can see where some of our competitors sit um, there with uh, competitors in Texas, um, in Arizona, with Tucson, Arizona there, um, with Denver. And moving to the next slide, you can see that we can add this 2% assessment and still stay below the national average for guest checkout fees. Um, so an important consideration as we took a look at this. Moving to the next slide, I just wanna talk about what impact this, the, the tourism marketing district will have. It will effectively double. We, these are pre-pandemic estimates, but based on what we um, have estimated, we believe will effectively double the marketing budget for Albuquerque. Um, and it's proposed to have a four point, just in that first year, um, very conservatively, a $4.8 million impact. So um, that's, that's the overall benefit um, and impact of the Tourism Marketing District. Julian, if you'll advance to the next slide. And then to the next slide. So just use Kate, you know, the making the case for why this is important. The market increased marketing sales and efforts lead to a heightened awareness of our city's diverse, diverse culture, rich heritage and unique events. More leisure visitors, sporting events and meetings mean a stronger demand for the lodging and hospitality services. 
increased employment in the hospitality industry, escalated economic growth and impact, and overall, um, just at the end of the day, a more vibrant and prosperous community. So how will these uh, funds be spent, overseen and spent? Uh, there will be um, both a governance committee and a management committee. And so on the next slide, you'll see that the governance committee will be comprised of lodging properties within the district that will provide the oversight to the management committee. The committee, um, it's important. This is a citywide district. It will include representatives from both full service and limited lodging, uh, lodging properties. And Visit Albuquerque will serve as the management committee. On the next slide, you'll see how the money will be used. And this is really the benefit of you have your premier destination marketing organization that already has the overall knowledge, the staff in place to really put this money to work. And so the commitment, this is the first year budget um, uh, proposal for the district plan is that 78% will go to sales, marketing, and communications. Um, so that money going directly to improve the appeal, the awareness, and the conversion um, opportunities for Albuquerque, those the, that increased demand. Um, no more than 10% will be spent on administration. 5% uh, will be dedicated to destination development. Some great opportunities there with um, to support work that's being done in events or with other promotions that we can um, look at tourism development and product development with that with those funding with that funding. 2% for visitor services. The 1% city fee, the city will collect these tourism marketing district funds in the same way using the same systems that they um, collect lodgers tax and hospitality fee and those then that they will. Uh, keep 1% of the total budget on an annual basis for that collection, then a 4% contingency reserve. Moving on to how this money will be then spent more specifically, see at the top advertising, public relations and media relations, social media, destination development, digital marketing, also be used for lead generation, trade shows, fam tours and visitor services. The reason that those four, those, those top uh, five categories are bolded we um, have, as you, um, many of you are, are well aware, we have really kind of three main areas of focus, leisure travel, meetings and conventions, and sports tourism. Right now we have, we have uh, the city contract course to um, ensure the meetings and conventions, sports tourism and leisure travel, um, that we're really trying to maximize all those opportunities. But right now we're, we feel like the leisure market is a tremendous opportunity for us. And this is where the dedication and working with the lodging community, the dedication is that the primary usage of these funds um, in these first couple of years will be to attract leisure tourism. That's really where we um, need to see growth for Albuquerque and where we have potential. And many of the hoteliers have benefited from that uh, throughout as we've started to recover from the pandemic. So that's why those top five categories are bold. And moving to the next slide, just want to point out again, citywide district using the business improvement district language uh, uh, legislation from the state. Um, so you'll see the orange category really captures uh, the hotel, the lodging properties within the district that are currently paying into the lodgers tax and uh, hospitality fee, with the exception of uh, short term rentals. So those are the um, those are the lodging properties uh, all that will all be captured in the, the district. Then moving to the next slide just see a reminder of this process as i said uh, before that january 19th moving the approving the planning group and that um opportunity for a public hearing today uh, before you for the uh with this ordinance and the um a, a appointing the management committee and then there is one additional step that we will need to take working with all of you to implement the benefit fee um, i have with me uh several members that of the planning group um, that i'd love to, to have an opportunity just for them to provide comment. All right, why don't you direct the topic there if you would, Ms. Armenta. Thank you, Council President Benton. Why don't I start, start with Deepesh Kowadwala. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you, Deepesh. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, what um, you know, Tanya presented the ATMD, and uh, I can tell you that um, I've been 
involved with this process for uh, over a year now. I'm a board member on the Lodgers Tax Advisory Board, and I'm also a board member on the Greater Albuquerque Hotel Lodging Association. And Sun Capital Hotel owns uh, eight hotels um, in New Mexico with uh, four in Albuquerque that we operate. And uh, this, this um, uh, ATMD is very important to the hotel industry. And uh, as you saw some of the, the data that Tanya presented, um, you know, the risk of not doing this is uh, great because we look at um, our competitive uh, cities where we're competing for group business or leisure business. Uh, and they just really outspend us on, on the marketing spectrum. And so this is a very important initiative for us to undertake. And um, just uh, by way of example, last year, uh, we saw really relevant uh, 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 improvement to the business. Uh, if you recall, the mayor had uh, put in a million dollars as a kickstart uh, funds because of COVID, we lost a lot of the lodger's tax opportunity. So the mayor had put in a million dollars uh, to do some additional marketing. And uh, Visit Albuquerque implemented that in the third and fourth quarter of last year. And we saw uh, remarkable uh, results uh, as a uh, fund. We were deploying the right marketing dollars within the right channels. Um, hoteliers are seeing improvement in business. November and December were probably by far the, the best on record for us. Uh, and it doesn't only help the hotel industry as more tourists come to Albuquerque, it, it really helps the entire uh, marketplace, restaurants, shopping, and hotels. So I thank you for uh, 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 listening to this and I, I hope uh, you consider uh, approving this. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Depesh. Uh, I will now move to uh, Damon Kompanowski from the Sheridan Uptown and the Greater Albuquerque Hotel and Lodging Association. Good evening, Mr. President and members of the council. I would just like to um, echo what Depesh said and also just add to it that, you know, that, that big piece of is the risk of not um, having the marketing dollars that the other cities also have is um, really um, something that stands out to me. As um, Depesh also said, that was that million dollars that we spent really helped us as a property. And what this will continue to do is keep us competitive within our markets. I look at cities as um, I recently moved here from Tucson, Arizona, and um, they really have stepped up their marketing and what they do. And we are such a like city that it's to me, if we don't do this, we put our city at risk. Um, we've had a tough two years of this, this, the, the pandemic, and this will really help us to recover. And we know we have a proven um, <clears throat> ROI with Visit Albuquerque and what they've done before in the past. And this is almost to me a no brainer that we continue to move forward with um, using Visit Albuquerque to really identify where to spend these dollars and how to spend these dollars to help all of us as an industry. When that happens, we get more employees working, we, um, our economy improves in the city, and we continue to grow. And um, I just think this is um, something that is a must, and um, we would hate to um, not see this happen. Thank you, Damon. And and then I'll move to Kanan Harris from Heritage Hotels and Resorts. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the council. My name is Kanan Harris, representing uh, Heritage Hotels and Resorts, one of the largest uh, hospitality employers in the state, uh, but also here in, New in Albuquerque. And uh, we have hotels that you know are in Old Town, Sawmill, uh, market, uh, Northern Corridor, and downtown, and uh, we, we, we do express our support for the ATMD. Uh, tourism and marketing districts have proven to be successful in attracting visitors and increasing occupancy, and uh, that results in a strong economic future for the city, creating vibrancy and job creation and visitor spending directly in our local market. So 
we see this as an opportunity right now. Albuquerque has proven to be very appealing at this time as a destination. And, and as we come out of the pandemic and particularly with its authenticity, its uniqueness. And so we see this as increasing the reach of marketing for Albuquerque and pushing Albuquerque into new markets. And uh, having been involved with this process for some time now, we think the opportunity that is right now that it presents itself is the right time to do this. So we do express our support for this. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Kanan. Then council president and members of the council, Prakash Sundram um, was not able to join us tonight. He is the president and CEO of Total Management Systems, but he just sent me a brief comment to share with you all. And that is, this is an opportunity for the lodging properties in Albuquerque to rally behind a common goal with shared benefits. The timing of this initiative is excellent. So with that, that completes our uh, presentation this evening and we would just stand for any questions. Uh, Councillor Sanchez and then Councillor Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. You, Mr. I had a question for Ms. Armenta. Um, I think this is a no-brainer to me. I don't have a problem with, with, with this at all. Um, one of the questions that I had is, let's say I wanted to do a staycation and wanted to, would we, st would we still be subject to um, that extra money as well? Or if we show an ID, can we just be exempt from that? Uh, let's say, for uh, let's example, a couple just wanted to get out and, and uh, have a quick little vacation or get away from the kids or their family life for the, for the minute or the weekend. Just wanted to know if you had made any proposals or made any change for that. Mayor Menta. Mayor Menta. Mayor Menta. Mayor Menta. Council President and, and Councilor Sanchez, uh, thank you. I intended to address that earlier and I apologize because you did bring that up at the last council meeting uh, in terms of the, the local opportunities. The discussion among the planning group was really that we know how important that is. We recognize um, just the, the wisdom that you bringing that forward um, in terms of the opportunity for locals. And what the suggestion from the planning group is, is that rather than um, taking a look at exemptions, just because collection would be so difficult, um, is that the planning group is um, committed that the district plan every year will have a very robust local promotion and staycation a variety of opportunities. At, so at all types of properties, um, an opportunity for um, niche marketing, target marketing, depending on different packages, along with um, just an opportunity for seasonal. So a, a strong commitment that will be in that marketing plan for the district plan on an annual basis for locals to ensure that really these savings will be well beyond what an, what an exemption from the assessment would be, that this will save them far more money and just a commitment that we recognize. It's important that our locals get out and see um, what our tourism offerings are because they can be our best ambassadors for, for Albuquerque and, and we want them to enjoy the environment they live in, of course. Thank you, Ms. Armenta. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you and, and uh, thank you to uh, Councillor Sanchez and Councillor Grout for joining the Visit ABQ board. Um, I've been in that board for a long time. I'm a great believer in what they do. So it's good to have some new blood in there to, uh, to work on it. Uh, Councillor uh, Lewis and then Councillor Pena. Thank you, Mr. President. And Ms. Armenta and your team, you all, you all have obviously put together just a great plan here. And I, uh, after my first vote, I got an earful from your members and I, I regret that first vote. Um, uh, but I did want to ask if you would go through the process of, uh, would, would, you, would you tell us just how many members are, how many lodging business members are there within the proposed district? Uh, and then what was the process for the petition, for those that signed the petition? I'm assuming that's the majority um, of, the, uh, of the lodging business owners. And were there, was there anybody in opposition to it that you know of? Council President Benton and Councillor Lewis, um, yes, thank you very much for the opportunity to detail that a bit more. So in regards to the current number of lodging properties that would be included, it is uh, approximately 150 um, hotels or lodgers that would be included in that. As I said, the, the only exception, um, it's a citywide um, district and captures everyone that's currently paying into the lodgers tax and hospitality fee. The only exception to that would be uh, short-term rentals. Uh, there is, we've also kept in mind uh, development in certain areas of town. So as new properties come on, they will be added to the uh, to the city to the to the district that are in those boundaries 
would be included in the assessment for, for that. In regards to the petition process, yes, we have met the majority um, of, of lodgers that are in support of, of this um, initiative. And that's what allowed us to bring it to you that first step in terms of the planning group and the public, public hearing, the petition for the public hearing. Uh, that process um, started last year and was done, um, was done through an electronic process. So it allowed us to ensure that we both, uh, through the email addresses, the overall collection of those um, uh, petitions, um, also captured where those came back from to ensure the integrity of those petitions. And so we have uh, submitted those to the city. We also have printed files for all of those petitions, um, should anyone request those. Uh, next is uh, Councillor Pena. Thank you, Mr. President. I think this is a great idea as well. I just had a couple of questions in reference to, um, you know, as saying that the responsibility is going to be on the city to collect the assessment fee and, and penalties and, and the like, and that we're going to be receiving 1% um, for this and in order to do this. And I'm not sure, I, has the city whoever is going to be in charge of this, so they evaluated if that's enough to be able to do that. And then um, the second part to my question would be, is that um, it, I know um, Ms. Armenta um, mentioned the short-term rentals, but does this fall into the rentals that are going to be the most, that are the motels that are being used for um, the homeless right now? To house, 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 Council, Council President Benton and uh, Councilor Pena. Uh, we will be collecting, or rather, we'll be keeping 1% of the total collection uh, as administrative fee, which, which would be roughly $48,000 a year. And that would help us pay for the software which we use to collect the lodger's tax and also some additional uh, staff time that would require to follow up and educate the. the Hotelier. So I think uh, we have discussed this percentage with uh, Ms. Armenta and we are comfortable with the arrangement. Okay, thank you. And then the other part to my question, I don't know who can answer that, but that would be just... I think that question was about the, the uh, Airbnb uh, question. I think that is Ms. Uh, Armenta should <laughs> probably be able to answer. About the home, about the home, about the home, about the home, about the home. I think there was think a there question. Was uh, you want to rephrase it, Councillor? Yeah. yeah, my question is is that I know we're using a lot of the motels in the city of Albuquerque to house the homeless, so I'm just wondering if that fee is going to be um, for that as well. It, you did mention on short-term rentals, but I don't know if that falls within that category or are we going to be you know, taxing ourselves? Uh, Council President Benson, Councillor Pena, um, we haven't specifically discussed this with the, the tourism folks, but uh, my understanding is that that contract is on a monthly basis as opposed to a per room basis that would incur this type of additional charge. Okay. So no. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councillor Grout. Thank you, Mr. President. I just have one question to Ms. Armenta. Um, will this increase taxes for the um, Albuquerque citizens? Council President Benton, Councillor Grout, um, with the the only um, in it, opportunity for that to occur would be if they stayed in a lodging property within Albuquerque. So um, this is something that, um, as Councillor Sanchez has identified, there are there are locals that um, have an opportunity. You know, they staycations and a variety of activity. Um, the commitment is to just have a very robust local program that does allow for savings for locals so that that 2% assessment, the savings would be far beyond the um, what the assessment, the additional assessment would be. I would also mention uh, to Councillor um, Pena's earlier question, important to note that um, if anyone stays, if there's any stays that are beyond 30 days, they are exempt from lodger's tax and hospitality fee. And this program is, is um, mirroring um, the lodger's tax and hospitality fee, the ordinance. So any stays beyond 30 days would also not have a tourism marketing uh, assessment either. All right. Councilors, any other questions, comments? Um, yeah, Councilor Bassan, thanks for your help on this and your interest in this very important topic. And I'll 
ask you to close. Mr. President, thank you for including me on this as well. I think anything that's going to help with visiting and tourism in Albuquerque is, is going to be very beneficial. I know that I still plan on prioritizing a reduction in crime and an improvement with homelessness, which I know is also something that was brought up to us as a concern by doing this, this tourism marketing district, but I don't think that they will have um, necessarily, we will be giving up one for the improvement of another. We will definitely still prioritize that at least on my end and from what I've gathered from the rest of the council. So um, I'm very excited that the businesses here want this that it will not be an increased burden beyond what is in our local um, and competing communities. So I think that uh, on the up and up with all of this all around, so I urge your support. Thank you. Councilors, there's a motion and a second for uh, a due pass on 014. All those in favor, raise your hand and say yes. Yeah. And that passes unanimously. Um, we will now move to 083. This is amending Chapter 9, Article 5, Part 5 of the Revised Ordinances of the City, the Albuquerque Clean Indoor Ordinance regarding public consumption of cannabis following the enactment of the New Mexico Cannabis Regulation Act, NMSA 78, Section 26-2C1, Amending Restrictions in Public Outdoor Areas. Councilor Davis. Mr. President, uh, in my professional life, I represent cannabis companies that might be interested in this item, so I'm going to recuse myself from this. Very good. So uh, I will move a due pass and a second from Councilor Bassan. Thank you. We do have an individual signed up to speak. Uh, apparently has not uh, is not on the call at this point, so we'll move on. Councilors, any discussion, questions? Any comments from the administration? Councillor Siebelkorn. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to um, bring up the issue that what was brought up in LUP recently. There was an amendment added to this bill that makes it an, a, a punishable offense to smoke cannabis in public. I don't think it's necessary. There's already a state law that says that you can't smoke cannabis in public unless you're in a cannabis consumption area. We seem to be set on creating additional enforcement options to police. I don't think our police need to be enforcing this law. I don't think they have the, um, the people on staff to even do that. And I just worry that we are making it where people of color have an additional problem with the law. And I really don't think that we need to be creating additional tools for punishment for smoking a completely legal substance. So I won't be supporting, thank you. Thank you, and uh, just on that subject, uh, I have the same concern about that redundancy. Um, and I guess I'll ask maybe Mr. Morrow. Um, so given that there's a state prohibition and there's a city prohibition with a penalty, would a, a, a offender, if we want to be calling call it that, be subject to a double charges of some kind, potentially? Council President, uh, thank you for that question. Um, frankly, no. Actually, as, as far as double charges go, the, the, the rules of double jeopardy exist uh, for a reason, so you'd only be punishable by state law or city ordinance. Right. Um, and my understanding uh, through uh, conversations with environmental health is the goal of having it and the, um, the clean air ordinance is to just allow um, our environmental health department to have uh, to participate in enforcement of uh, the state law that otherwise they would not be able to enforce. All right, so this would allow the involvement of our EHD, um, whatever, in assistance, I suppose, of the state in enforcing that law. Council President, that is correct. Uh, Council Bassan. Uh, Mr. President, so. Why does environmental health need to enforce laws when it comes to something like this? Uh, Council President and Councilor Bassan, uh, my belief is that uh, actually that environmental health would be um, the best uh, department to answer your question. Uh, specifically, they are involved in public safety in a number of ways. I know that specifically they um, deal with um, food health, uh, 
food, health, and safety in restaurants and things of that ilk, uh, and that this was an extension of that um, authority is to provide those kind of inspections so that otherwise state law would be enforced um, by state agents. And so it just provided an additional layer of um, enforcement so that uh, overburdened um, resources, well, not overburdened, but so that resources could be used effectively to maintain public safety. Thank you, Mr. President. So I guess I wasn't concerned about this until now. And I think that it's very important. I understand that environmental health has to go to different facilities and they have to manage and oversee um, certain aspects of it, but why I don't understand why we would be counting on them to be enforcing any kind of consumption of cannabis in any kind of undesignated area throughout the city if it is legal on a state level. Uh, so, so I am concerned by that, and I don't know if there's further clarification that we can have so that it can be a little bit uh, eased in my mind, but I I'm never a fan of duplicating and anything unless it needs to be clarified as far as on the council and in the city so that we make sure that the legislation matches the state legislation. So if we're matching the state legislation, I would be in support of this. But if we're overstretching and overreaching from the state legislation so that we can improve or increase the amount of um, enforcement that we have, that is a little bit concerning right now. Mr. Demena, I don't know if you can, Director, if you can help with any of that or no, or. Mr. Demena. Okay, I'll try to speak a little clearer than uh, the last time. Thank you, uh, President Benton and Councilor Bassan. Um, we are actually in the process still of, of sorting out exactly where our enforcement will will go and won't go because we've been watching as the state has continued to promulgate rules that come from the act. Um, but uh, yeah, as, as was explained, we would be looking at things like uh, food permits. Um, we, are, we are creating ad additional enforcement positions to handle the local level of cannabis enforcement, things that the state doesn't cover through the time, place, and manner allowances for the city. Um, so uh, other areas where that would uh, expand in the future would include things like odor complaints, um, things like that. So I don't, I don't see environmental health being the agency that would approach someone in a park or on a sidewalk, uh, but we might look to uh, things like regulating consumption areas uh, or potentially adjacent areas to, to consumption, uh, things like you know sidewalks where you guys are supposed to be inside, you're supposed to be in the enclosed area, but you've got constantly got people kind of coming out into the alleyways, onto the sidewalks, we're getting complaints about that type of thing. So, Mr. Yep, Mr. Melendrez, do you, can you help with that? Mr. Melendrez. I, I think I might be able to add a little bit of gloss um, on the Clean Indoor Air Act, and it specifically authorizes uh, the APD to also enforce the Clean Indoor Air Act, so I think that that would be the more likely place of enforcement, especially on a park or a sidewalk. I guess now my question is, Mr. President, too, is uh, do we, do? what's the urgency in passing this? Or should we maybe even consider a deferral so that we can iron out some of these details, being that environmental health is the reason why we're looking at passing this in some way or another, but then at the same time, environmental health is still waiting to see what happens from the state level and how things iron out in the near future. Is there an urgency? I'll ask um, Mr. Melendres uh, with regard to the timeline uh, for getting this in place. Mr. President and counselors, I think, um, so I mean, if you just sort of think contextually about what's going on in the state with respect to uh, cannabis, um, the time frame for recreational purchases and use is approaching um, at the beginning of April. And so there's not a hard time frame in which if the council doesn't act upon this immediately, uh, that it would not be able to act upon it at a later time. Um, however, acting upon it now would set the rules in place for the city and what the city's expectation is in advance of recreational coming online. So I would like to move deferral for 30 days on this because I think that it sounds to me like we're putting the cart before the horse when it comes to, I mean, Director DeBena even said they're still working on staffing up any kind of enforcement if that were the case. So even if we were to pass this, what's to say that we're going to be able to do anything about it? And that just makes us look foolish in my opinion. So I think that it would be 
behoove us to actually make sense and see what happens as this comes out in the next couple of weeks and then we can revisit this as a council so that we can move forward with knowing a little bit about how it goes and I don't think that means it'll be too late it means that we can polish it up and do things in the right order so that motion if I could adjust it slightly would be to the second meeting in April I'd like to say something to you uh, uh, just a second we'll we will uh, we do have a, have a queue lined up to speak but there is a motion so it, and is there a second so that motion there's a second for Councillor Thiebelkorn so um, that is the the motion on the floor councillors so uh, we do need to speak to that but I'll I'll continue with the folks who are in the queue so Councillor Sanchez I actually think my comment could have an effect on the motion as well um, as a retired law enforcement officer the city ordinance uh, the rules of city ordinance are totally totally full of these kind of things that go on and Mr. Melendres can tell you that and any law enforcement officer in the room can tell you that we have the city code we have the state code and we have the federal court, court uh, code and every single every single almost every single law um, that we look at in a misdemeanor uh, context is literally has a duplicate at at the city level so it's very important that the city has a an, an arm to be able to enforce these it's it's told you have you know you have the jurisdiction but what happens if you get in a situation where the state's not available at the time to enforce the law and you can just reach over to a police officer to enforce the law or even um, code enforcement to enforce the law it's very very important even though these laws are duplicated you have to understand that it's constant and it happens more than you would would think um, and I think it's very very important that we have a uh, law that we can enforce at the local level in in order to make sure that the public is kept safe it's it's about safety it's about doing the right thing for not only just the cannabis distributors but also for and you the people that use cannabis but also for the individuals who are the citizens of Albuquerque who may not feel the same way as everyone else and may need some sort of enforcement we don't know what's going to happen this is a this is a subject we have no idea about how things are going to trend so to get rid of a local enforcement at this early stage of a game is a very very bad decision I think we can see how we can use um, the enforcement to actually help on both sides of this Councillor, Councillor Pena. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I agree if it's a good law. So um, one of my concerns is, I won't reiterate what um, Councillor Feeblecorn said, but you know, I think that this law really impacts people of color. Um, oftentimes some of these laws w that have, um, you know, that are well intended, they actually affect, affect um, uh, a, a disproportionate amount of minorities in our community. Uh, it's similar to when we're talking about marijuana and all these laws, and as we um, began to um, make this legal, um, we actually have a law in the book that says that officers can't, um, cannot um, have smoked marijuana in the last three years, and guess who that affects? That affects people of color, right? So, you know, we really need to start working on some of these laws, and when we're passing marijuana and seeing that we're actually making something legal and still creating barriers and boundaries for people of color that use um, marijuana, I think we have to really pay attention to that. So um, I, I would support the, the deferral, but currently in its current form, I don't, I don't support this piece of legislation. Thank you. All right, Councilor Feeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, you know, I do agree with Councilor Sanchez that there are lots of opportunities in our state law and in our local laws, there's a lot of duplication. But I think that the trend should be towards having less enforceable tools that can be treated differently depending on who APD or environmental health apparently is talking to. Because we all know that as we have additional enforcement tools that can be treated differently depending on if you're talking to me or if you're talking to a person of color, that is an unfair way of dealing with these situations. Cannabis is legal. Um, if we have somebody smoking cannabis, cannabis in public in a non-cannabis consumption area, that is illegal. It can be enforced by our APD. It can be enforced by anybody within the city. It's a state law. We do not need to create additional tools that can unfairly and unjustly target certain types of people. 
Thank you. Any other comments? Councillor Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. And, and these are all make sense in today's world, but I don't understand how we can say that we can't enforce this um, if it is a law and it's unjust, when in fact we have laws against drinking alcohol, which is legal. We have laws against drinking alcohol on the streets. Uh, we have areas where alcohol consumption is legal and areas where alcohol consumption is not legal. And we haven't narrowed that down to a person's color or their ethnic background. I think a law is a law is a law. And if we're going to have allow public consumption um, of cannabis, we'd better be careful how we do it. And I'm not, I'm not saying we shouldn't have public consumption. I'm saying, do we want it walking down up and down our sidewalks while tourists, many times older people, must admit, many times families, do we want the smoking to be allowed, the consumption to be allowed on our city streets, our sidewalks? We, we can't narrow this down either way. We can't say this is um, not right because we're going to affect a certain kind of people. Laws are laws are laws, and they should be enforced the same. And I know you're going to tell me that doesn't happen. That's very Pollyanna-ish of me. But it is the way the law works. And we can't say we can exclude this particular segment of people because it's not fair and it's enforced more, which is the same as saying this particular class of people or type of person or look or whatever they have, it's okay for them to do something, but it isn't okay for me to do something because I am an old white woman and I'm very white and very old. I think we have to be very careful about how we present these things and deal with it. Are we going to make cannabis consumption legal and okay on all of our sidewalks? Or are we going to try to confine it to certain areas of the city or certain areas of the um, facility, the professional, the business? We can't, we can't pull out one kind of person or another. We can't say that, that because you are one type of person, you can't do this. But if you're this type of person, even though law says you can't do it, you can do it. We have to be fair about laws. And I know fair, laws haven't been fair in the past. But I'm, I have a real problem with your, your statement and your argument, Councillor Peeblecorn, and not just, it's not just against you. But I think if we're going to have laws, we need to have laws. And they're the same for everyone. And I, for one, do not like the idea of our tourists who aren't all in favor of cannabis consumption, who would now be walking uh, in the streets where it's allowed, because that's what we're doing. If we're saying that we can do this, we, we can't confine it to a patio or not a patio. I, I think we need to think about this. Do we need to defer it? Maybe we do. do are we ready to vote now? That's the sponsor's uh, choice on that. But I, I'm not appreciating the argument the way it's coming out. This is not an... Um, an issue of one kind of person against another person. We're talking about the consumption of cannabis in public and how we're going to control it. So, thank you. Um, Mr. Melendres, did, did, did you have any, I guess I'm gonna ask you just quickly, that again, to clarify, this is only on the motion for a deferral right now. I went ahead and, and uh, allowed everyone to uh, speak their piece on it, which, which may also indicate their vote on the deferral. But I wanted to ask a question by either Mr. Moore or or Mr. Melendres, or both, um, with the example of alcohol, for instance, uh, and uh, public street consumption outside of a private uh, site, consumption of alcohol. Do we have our own ordinances on that, uh, in addition to the state ordinance? Mr. President, uh, I am not sure if we have an open consumption ordinance within the city. I know that it is illegal within the city. Uh, but I'm not sure the source of that. I could, we could find that out relatively quickly. Maybe Mr. Murrow knows the answer. Well, I'm going I'm to support the deferral motion, and and uh, I would like a memo, a, a legal memo from uh, from uh, the city attorney's office with regard to that question. And then, uh, unless there are any other comments, we'll move to a vote. Councilor Pena. Just just one more. You know, I appreciate Councilor Jones's. Um, comments and, and how, how she views it, you know, but being a person of color, I just want to say that 
Allah is Allah is Allah. But unfortunately, as we see what's happening in our nation, um, sometimes the laws don't apply and disproportionately people of color are the people that are, are you know, have these run-ins with the law or, you know, di just different types of things. So I just want to say that, you know, it, um, I wished Allah was a law and we all had to face it the same. But unfortunately, when there is a person un of not of color who um, is walking down the street and maybe um, smoked some marijuana, and, and then you have a person of color who, in some people, unfortunately, think of looking differently, acting differently, they would be more likely to get um, to get pulled over. So, you know, that's where, where my concern lies. I wish it was as black and white as um, as as you view it, but unfortunately, it's not. Until we get there, we have to make sure that we're you know good stewards of the laws and policies that we pass to ensure that we have equity across the board. So, thank you. All right. There's a motion and a second for the deferral to the second meeting in April. Uh, Mr. President, that would be April 18th. April. 18th. Thank you. So all those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. All those opposed? And that fails on a four to four vote. So we're back on the bill uh, as, uh, as presented. And um, any further comment? I, you know, or, or I'll go ahead and close. Mr. President? If I may, I have an answer for you on the open container question. The city does have its own independent ordinance uh, prohibiting open containers in public in the city. All right. Thank you. Councillor Peeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I think that's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Um, I did not know that that was a law. And I was in my neighborhood park, and we had some margaritas. And an officer came up to us and said, that's illegal. Please put it away. And we said, oh my gosh, we're so sorry. Mm -hmm. Also in my park, a person of color was found drinking and they received a ticket. That is how it's actually working in the real world. And so adding additional tools to punish some people is not okay with me. Um, and I will say again, for the record, it is illegal in the state of New Mexico to smoke cannabis in public, period. It's a state law. We just are trying to say that we don't need to add additional tools that can punish people, some people, and not others. Thanks. Councilor Sanchez. 26 years of law enforcement, and uh, I'm a person of color. I enforced the law as the law was the law. I didn't do any of the things that uh, the counselors are talking about. I enforced the law. If you broke a, broke a law, I didn't care what law it was. I didn't care who was sitting there. Breaking the law, I arrested based on the law. And I did that for 26 years. And I feel 100% confident that I did the job the way that I'm supposed to. And my, and my fellow men and women of Albuquerque Police Department, every single time that I was out there working, I saw that they did the same exact thing. They arrested based on the law. They took an oath of office. They were vetted through the system. The system is very, very difficult to get through. It's not an easy thing to do. And you're always talked about it. You're always scrutinized. We go through hours and hours and hours and hours of training in reference to these kinds of issues. And I honestly believe that um, sometimes when the talk comes up about this, that it's actually reverse discrimination in a way. Um, because when I was out there working the streets, we did not do it. I was working with officers of every, every race and gender and color. And every single time we went out and made an arrest, we didn't talk to each other and say, hey, this person's of a different color than I am and I'm going to enforce the law differently. That never, ever, in 26 years, ever came up. We enforced the laws based on the way the laws were written and if you broke the law or not and we had probable cause to arrest, period. I think it's really important that we have um, enforcement at the city level in reference to this issue. It's one of the most important things um, that we're looking at because if something goes, I mean, you, f you figure a police officer, if somebody's consuming in an area that they shouldn't be, and, um, and let's say, for example, that smoke um, transfers to maybe a child who maybe could get sick, that smoke maybe transfers to a teenager who could get sick, maybe that smoke transfers to 
a law enforcement officer or a public safety individual, maybe somebody who actually has to take drug tests um, on a continuous basis, like we did when we worked narcotics, when we worked when I worked narcotics, and when I worked in the field services bureau. Um, it, these things are very very necessary. So it's really an important thing so that that we don't um, cross contaminate people who don't need it, and we should have an enforcement arm in place to do that. Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, I, I guess I'm, I didn't follow and read through all of the state laws to be able to compare with the city laws, but I, are we saying that this will now allow APD to be able to enforce the law when it comes to if they were consuming, if people are consuming cannabis outside of a designated location? Or so does this, if we now have it as amended, mean that APD will be able to enforce the law, or did it before mean that APD could enforce the law? Mr. President, Councilor Bassan, with this amendment, the city would have a city ordinance, I'm sorry, APD would have a city ordinance to enforce. Absent this amendment, uh, APD would not. Thank you, that's all I need to hear. All right. No other comments? Uh, I'll close. Um, Council President, may I speak for a moment? This is, oh, Mr. Morrow. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Certainly. Uh, Council President, Councilor Brisson, and I, I agree with um, what Mr. Melendra said insofar as that APD would not be able to enforce a city ordinance absent a city ordinance. However, they are able to enforce state law. I would ask, and my understanding is um, as to what has been previously said that um, smoking marijuana or smoking cannabis in public is still prohibited by state law, so APD would be able to enforce that. Mr. Melendres, I'll, I'll, I'll allow you to uh, give your opinion on that. Mr. President, I, I'll apologize for the confusion around this issue, although I did not create it. Um, so the, 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 the two contexts that this comes up in, in the Cannabis Re Regulation Act, uh, deal with licensees and then a statement about not prohibiting and not allowing. And so the Cannabis Regulation Act sets up the framework within which recreational cannabis can be used and consumed within the state. Its provisions deal largely, if not exclusively, with how licenses are handled in the state and what licenses may or may not do. And so the first way that this comes up is with respect to the provisions on cannabis consumption areas. The Cannabis Regulation Act has provisions that say that uh, procurers, purchasers of cannabis cannot smoke cannabis in a public place related to a license. So in other words, they're going into an establishment, this is all in the context of a license. Under what circumstances can you smoke cannabis on a licensed premise? And that is if that licensee also has a cannabis consumption area. So in the context of the act, what it is saying is that you are not permitted to smoke cannabis on a licensed premise outside of that cannabis consumption area. That's the context of that prohibition. The other thing that the act says is that nothing herein shall be construed as permitting the smoking of cannabis within public. And so neither of those provisions have any prohibition that a law enforcement officer would be able to enforce directly. They have a statement about what you can do on a licensed premise, and then it has a statement that the act itself is not saying that you're allowed to smoke in public. So essentially it's saying we're not saying you can't, you, we're not saying you can't, as far as a, a public place being a place outside of a licensed premise. So those are the two contexts that it's dealt with in. Um, we've dealt with issues in this council before about what is required for an ordinance to be criminally enforceable. And in order for an ordinance to be criminally enforceable by any law enforcement officer, it has to have uh, language that is much more clear than a statement that nothing herein shall mean that you cannot, or nothing herein shall be construed as. In order for a criminal ordinance to be enforceable, it has to have language of prohibition, which the ordinance that the council is considering has, and it also has to have some reference to a penalty. And with respect to the city, any ordinance that doesn't have an express reference to a specific penalty defaults to the city's standard misdemeanor penalty, 1199. So that's the, sort of the, the world within which this provision exists. It's not inconsistent with the act because the act does not contemplate an authorization for somebody to smoke cannabis outside of a licensed premise. 
to the extent within the license premise, it contemplates only within a licensed cannabis consumption area. The complementary sort of nature of this proposal, if the council enacts it, is that it, it would fill that gray area about whether or not once you purchase something in a cannabis establishment and you walk out onto the sidewalk, what your rights or limitations are at that point. Uh, the Cannabis Regulation Act does not deal with that point directly. Did the state amend the D. Johnson Act with regard to this subject? Mr. President, it did not. It amended the D. Johnson Act with respect to all of the other amendments that the, the city is doing, uh, but did not re uh, amend it with respect to this. All right, thank you. Councilor Fiebelkorn. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to point out that the state did not amend the D. Johnson Indoor Air Quality Act because this is not indoor air quality. Um, it is not, uh, not affecting indoor air quality, which is what that law is for. We're also trying to put this in our Indoor Air Quality Act, and that's a problem as well. But um, that is why that wasn't updated, not for any other reason. All right. Thank you. Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, I'm I'm all for making sure to give APD any tools necessary to simplify and streamline their job. I'm not excited about giving them more to do because I think that they're buried in that. I'm not excited about environmental health enforcing these laws when there seems to be a little bit of confusion. But I also am in favor of making sure that we clear up any gray areas, as Mr. Melendrez pointed out. Um, so I won't keep doing this, but Due to the lack of confusion or the, the expression of some confusion and some need for clarity, I believe, based off of what I've heard tonight, I would like to make a motion for deferral to the first meeting in April, and then I'll give up if you all don't want to do that. But I think that this could be something that we could find a middle ground on or at least make sure that we all understand a little bit better instead of being one way extreme over the other. And I really still stand by my cart before the horse on this as well. Second from Council Pena. Uh, Mr. Melendrez, this, this was a, is a different motion because of the date, correct? Mr. President, that is correct. The first motion was for April 18th. This is for April 4th. Um, just a little bit of context. If the uh, do pass fails again, then we would vote to, I mean, I'm sorry, if the uh, deferral fails again, then we'd def default back to the do pass motion. If that motion were to fail by a tie, then the bill would die at that point for, for lack of. Uh, motion in the affirmative, vote in the affirmative. All right, that's uh, that's pretty clear, I think. <laughs> um, and and again, uh, I, I will support the motion for a deferral because I think we could use all just a little collectively an understanding of all the implications of our actions tonight. And I think uh, we could save ourselves a lot of brain damage because at some point, some of these provisions within this bill, we are going to need we're focused on one aspect of uh, one uh, part of it, and uh, the rest of the bill is is going to be necessary at some point. So uh, I personally will uh, support the motion. And so if there's no other comments at this point, uh, we'll uh, we'll um, vote on the deferral. All those in favor, raise your hand and say yes. Yes. Opposed. And that passes on a uh, five to three, five to three vote. Thank you. Um, so that bill is deferred until the 4th of April. We'll now move to Councillor Lewis for Committee Substitute 01. Mr. President, Committee Substitute 01 is amending the enactment number 2018 001, Council Bill number. 18.9 to rescind, rescind the one eighth of one percent of the overall three eighths of one percent gross receipts tax imposed. Thereby, I move a due pass. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Adam Squire. Adam, please feel free to turn your video on, unmute yourself, and your two minutes will begin when you start speaking. Mr. President, Councillor uh, Lewis, um, thank you for having me tonight. I'm a CPA here in Albuquerque. I'm calling in to support the reduction of the gross receipts tax. It's my understanding that this tax was mandated. I'm sorry, I gotta get to the kids here. 
this was a mandated tax and not approved by the voters. I feel like making Albuquerque a better place is good for us all. And to do that, we need to bring the poor out of poverty. This is a tax on the poor. I'm sorry, I'm having uh, issues, echo issues. This is a tax on the poor. It's a tax on the elderly. It's a tax on people of color. And it's a tax on every gender. We are in a period of inflationary times right now. We are all working one month out of the year for nothing because of our inflation. We need to make Albuquerque a better place. We need to increase the wealth of the poor and therefore bring down crime. As for the use of this mandated tax, I understand it may be for free bus fare or other items. My mother got hit by the bus the other day. She's not the only one that got hit, according to the art bus driver. There are free fares on the bus, but I want you to think about the unattended consequences of some of these things you're passing. You pass, you pass these things like smoking pot in public and you make the cops take care of it. Well, the cops are busy with crime. Crime is an issue, homelessness is an issue. These people are busy. Now, as for my mother, she got physical, physically injured and she's paying thousands of dollars to get her car repaired. That's an unintended consequence. So please reduce our taxes and even by an eighth of a percent, that, that's gonna be a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Miguel Titman. Miguel, please feel free to turn your video on, unmute yourself and your time will begin when you start speaking. Thank you, uh, President Benton, counselors. Uh, my name is Miguel Titman, the president of the IFF Local 244, uh, representing firefighters in Albuquerque and Merlino County. <clears throat> Surely our firefighters would also uh, understand and appreciate a sentiment to lower the taxes presented by Councilor Lewis. Um, but with the current, uh, the current situation of homelessness challenges being active and ongoing, uh, elevated inflation, uh, post-pandemic volatile economy, and the biggest reason our public safety staffing and recruiting challenges continue for both APD uh, and Albuquerque Fire Rescue. Um, the firefighters here in Albuquerque area do not support this bill. We urge you counselors as well to not support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, that concludes public comment. Mr. President, and uh, I want to thank the, those that commented tonight and then all the emails that have come in also over the last few weeks. Appreciate all the support. Um, many emails that have come in to the council. And um, my, my intention tonight, I, I'm going to, um, and I think that's the, the intention of the sponsors of the other bill is to defer this bill um, with the hopes that we're, we're going to have some conversations and, and get some alignment um, on the two bills here very shortly. So I'm going to move a... Uh, a deferral, and I and I would say that you know, we've had some you know budget briefings over the last uh, week, and um, very very clear and, and public that you know, we've had a, a pretty incredibly large increase in revenues over the last year, about ninety million dollars in our projected budget and revenue uh, last year, increase in ninety million dollars to this year actual you know revenues, and so um, uh, you know I'm looking forward to continuing to. Um, uh, make this uh, make this case and and talk this through, but um, I do want to go ahead and I'll go ahead and move a, a two week deferral uh, to the next council meeting. Um, and again, we we hope to get some alignment on these two bills. Thank you. And we have a second from Councilor Davis. And uh, yeah, just to confirm that that is a, that our same intention on the uh, the next bill uh, that that's uh, on the same uh, topic of the. Uh, hold harmless tax as it's known and so with that uh, all those in favor of the deferral for the April 4th say yes opposed that passes unanimously we'll move on to item F counselors uh, Davis Fiebelkorn and myself committee substitute 09 and this is amending enactment of uh, 
Dewey, 1801, Council Bill uh, number 0189, which imposed the three eighths of a center gross receipts tax. I move it to pass. Second. There's a motion and a second from uh, Council Peeblecorn. And uh, we do have also individuals to sign up to speak for this matter. And just for the, for the information of the individuals, again, uh, we do intend to move a referral, but we want to hear from you. Thank you, Mr. President. We have Rachel Biggs. Please feel free to turn your video on, and your time will begin when you start speaking. Good evening, Mr. President, City Council members. I do understand the intent to defer tonight, but I couldn't pass up the opportunity to speak in support of this amendment to the ordinance. We're really excited about this. My name is Rachel Biggs with Albuquerque Healthcare for the Homeless, a federally qualified health center that serves approximately 7,000 individuals without homes throughout Bernalillo County. As we all know, Albuquerque was experiencing a housing crisis before the pandemic began and COVID has only exacerbated these issues. Too many of our families have struggled to remain safely and stably housed, due in large part to our severe shortage of affordable housing for people with the lowest incomes in Albuquerque before the pandemic began. We also know that Albuquerque and affordable housing in Albuquerque is really a main driver of improving public safety. Affordable housing development benefits communities by improving the safety of neighborhoods, enhancing city blocks with newer rehabilitated properties and increasing or stabilizing property values over time. The Urban Institute report that was commissioned and paid for by the city of Albuquerque recommends that the city close the 15,500 unit gap of affordable housing that exists by preserving existing affordable housing and also pr producing new units and increasing our amount of housing vouchers. As stated by the report findings, these steps can quickly address Albuquerque's increasing homelessness and help renters who have barriers to finding and maintaining housing. Amending the 3 eighths hold harmless gross receipts tax to designate 40% of the revenues for affordable housing is really one of the smartest investments we can make in our economy right now. I urge your support of this amendment in, to the ordinance in the future, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Mr. President, that concludes public comments. Mr. President, R2 is amending the declaration of local emergency due uh, to the no, novel, novel coronavirus COVID-19 to ban vaccine requirements for city employees setting policy for future declarations. I move it due pass. I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of allowing R2 to be adopted the same evening it's substituted. Mr. Melendres, uh, please. President Benton, Councillor Lewis, prior to that rule suspension motion, we need to first move a floor substitute and take a vote on that. Okay. It's at the bottom of page nine. Okay, I'm just going to make my first motion the, the motion to suspend the rules, right? Oh, we got to vote on the, the floor sub first, Mr. On the floor President, sub. President, Councillor Lewis. Oh, I, that's separate. Okay, I move the floor sub. R2. All right, there's a motion for the floor substitute and uh, Councillor uh, Jones uh, seconded. And so we have the, the substitution uh, before us. All those in favor say yes. Raise yes. Your hand. Yes. Opposed? And uh, there's a, there's uh, that passes on an eight to one vote with Councillor Peebrook Corn opposed. We'll move that the rules be, uh, and now uh, 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 Councillor Lewis. Please. And Mr. President, the uh, the suspension rule. I'm going I'm to move the rules be suspended for the purpose of allowing R2 to be adopted this evening, evening it's substituted. Is there a motion and a second from Councillor Jones to suspend the rules as a motion just for the suspension of the rules so that we could actually uh, act on this uh, floor substitute tonight. And this rule will require a two thirds vote of the council. That'd be six votes uh, in favor in order to suspend the rules. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, all those in favor of the suspension of the rules, R raise your hand and say yes. Yes. Opposed? And that passes on a uh, uh, six to three. Five to six three, excuse me. All right. 
And um, so we were back on the bill. And thank you, Mr. President. This, uh, this is um, really straightforward. It's, uh, you know, the intention is to, regardless of what uh, um, laws that we might have to uh, um, abide by, the federal, federal uh, laws or even state laws, um, this would not apply to that. Of course, we'd, be, we'd have to abide by anything that would uh, come in possibly in that regard. But this is saying that as far as the city of Albuquerque, um, that our policy uh, will not be to uh, mandate uh, vaccines among our city employees and want to give them the peace of mind that they're not, they wouldn't have to uh, make a decision between uh, taking a vaccine that they may not want or need and, and their jobs. So um, I urge your support. Thank you. So um, we're back on the floor substitute, correct? Um, so um, this is uh, the motion for the floor substitute. All those in favor say, May. oh yeah, absolutely. This is on the substitution, yeah. Uh, I think we've done the substitution, Mr. President. I believe we're on the motion to pass. Okay. Okay. Pass the sub. Okay. Sorry, I want to be sure we're all in the same place. Mr. President, just do some clarification. So there was some procedural requirements to get this bill available for uh, final action tonight. So the first action that was done was a due pass of the original bill. The second was to move the floor substitute. That motion passed. So the bill that's on the table, it's now the floor substitute. The third motion was a suspension of the rule so that the bill as, a, as substituted may be acted on finally tonight. So that's the motion that you're on right now is a due pass of the bill as substituted. All right. So it's, it's as substituted, and final any discussion? Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. On the, on the matter of the final action on the substituted bill, I, I, we had this discussion at, at FGO, and I appreciate Councillor Lewis bringing it. It's clearly a discussion the community wants to have. Uh, but some of the staff write-ups and some of the comments we heard in committee um, sort of led with some assumptions that, of what might happen uh, if we maintain our, uh, our vaccine mandate. Um, and so I want to ask first, um, as I understand it, uh, the current policy, and, and I, I don't know where to go with this, so I'm going to go sort of to the administration. Well, I guess we don't have a current policy first. Let me ask from the administration. What is the administration's current personnel policy relating to COVID-19 vaccines for staff? Council President Benson, Councillor Davis, there is currently a provision in an administrative instruction that allows for paid time off in order to receive a vaccine, but there is no requirement or mandate of a vaccine in any department. Thank you, Ms. Nair. That's helpful. Uh, I appreciate that. And um, there was some notice in, or some comment in the staff write-up and in public comment that uh, if the city were to pursue a mandate, we would see resignations from public safety, in particular uh, employees. Uh, Ms. Nair, there was some conversation before, if you recall, about a proposed bill or at the end of last year. Um, are you aware of any persons who put in a notice to resign or gave notice of any re that they would not comply either with the option to test on a weekly basis to prove their ability to come to work or to show proof of a vaccine? Council President Benton, Councillor Davis, since there was never officially imposed in ma a vaccine mandate, there were no related resignations. However, a couple points of interest nationwide, we saw it was below one or two percent uh, of folks who did resign in response to mandatory vaccines. And also, when we did believe that the federal mandate was going to come down and require a, a vaccine mandate, um, we did uh, experience a uh, temporary restraining order request and other actions from all of our bargaining units, um, APOA, IAFF, and uh, the asthma units, I believe. So we know um, those are two sort of gauges of the response of our employees. Thank you, Ms. Nair, and thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, I think uh, I appreciate where this comes from, but I think the fact is that um, we've talked about this at Public Safety. Councilor Sanchez will, will um, understand this very well from his own experience, just like mine. Um, I think we have certain city employees who do a very uh, important job, and we saw it during COVID that when um, we have a crisis and, uh, and we need to reallocate city employees, we had uh, bus drivers and uh, driving senior meals and delivering more than a million senior meals from city staff from the parks department. Uh, we had folks from cultural affairs um, working in, par in uh, uh, playgrounds to, de to sanitize them so that kids could use them and have a safe place to go outside. 
Um, I think the government has a really important job. And when we sign up for these things, we sign up to do what needs to be done. Uh, I worry if we don't have an ability um, to set some standards for a healthy workforce uh, in our city so that when we're called upon to do those really important primary jobs, we have the staff available to do them. Um, quite frankly, um, I think the proposal that uh, the Councilor Benton had introduced and in line with what the administration introduced was, was reasonable. Uh, I don't think it was a vaccine mandate at all. It was a testing mandate, and it just said, if you want to come to work, get a test. If you don't want to take the test, bring us a proof of your vaccine, um, and we'll give you one for free. Um, that seemed very reasonable to me, uh, and we had a number of city employees who, who took advantage of that process. So uh, I don't see a need to do this. Um, I think it's important that the city maintains its flexibility to maintain a healthy workforce and determine the rules for working in our city, um, and so I'll be voting against it, so thank you. Councillor Bassan. Mr. President, so the science doesn't say that getting vaccinated will actually keep others safe from you. The science says that getting vaccinated keeps yourself safer from others. So I think it's ironic that we're asking the first responders to go in, first responders, city employees, whoever is at the, the ground floor of making sure that our city continues to run, to actually go and still fight for us, protect us, do all the things that everyone else doesn't want to do while also saying now we want to tell you what to do with your own personal health when really if people choose to not get vaccinated one of the reasons or one of the risks that they might take is that they indeed put themselves at bigger risk not necessarily to minimize the spread of covid for others so um i i support everybody getting vaccinated i think it's incredibly important i think that it is beneficial i think that it is the smart thing to do but that's my opinion and i don't want to end up expressing that on behalf of other people, nor do I think that it's fair that we mandate such. So I will not um, vote against this. I will definitely be in support that we allow people to choose what's important to them, especially when it's actually saying you should probably get vaccinated because it will keep you safe. It's not necessarily keeping others safe from those who are unvaccinated. Councilor Grout. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I've heard from the APOA uh, union president and also the um, AFR um, vice president, union vice president, and they both ask that um, we don't make those folks get a, get a vaccine unless they want to. I do believe that you should get a vaccine. I do think it's important, but it should be a personal choice. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, Councilor Pena. Thank you, Mr. President. So just a quick question. Um, you know, it's like you can agree with everyone who, who's speaking, but the truth of the matter is, is that we do not have a mandate, never have had a mandate. So we're creating a law that says that we're not going to do a mandate. And so my only concern with that, or maybe my, my concern with that, not the only concern, is that um, I agree that everybody should be vaccinated. I believe that if people, you know, know lots of people who chose not to, and unfortunately, you know, some recovered from it, some didn't. But um, but we still have variants out there. We still have things happening. So this would take away our ability if something really, really tragic happened in the world um, in terms of, you know, really needing vaccines in order just to survive, we would have taken away that ability. Council President Benton, Councillor Pena, uh, so correct. We have never had a vaccine mandate. Uh, the only thing that was ever proposed was the test or vax mandate, and that was because it was a federal requirement. Um, also correct that this would take away future flexibility. Um, and also, if there were to be a federal mandate, I think you would have an open question about whether this would need to be repealed or would just be repealed by operation of law. So, okay, um, thank you, Mr. President. I mean, that answers my question. I, I agree that, you know, I think people should have the right to, to um, you know, decide whether they want to be vaccinated or not. But when we take away that ability and that flexibility into the future, not knowing what the future holds, I think that, um, you know, that's just a little concerning because as a government, we don't move fast enough sometimes. So, thank you. Uh, uh, Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, Councilor Pena, this, this resolution as substituted is expressly saying for the COVID-19 vaccination. So it would be saying that we would be prohibiting any kind of mandate for a COVID-19 vaccination status. And even though there's other variants, it's also being proven that these variants are more mild, even though they might transfer a little bit more rapidly. The cases are more mild and they're not so detrimental to the, to the life-threatening 
issues that we saw with the original pandemic that happened. So um, I just hope that you would keep that in mind, that it's not necessarily saying that we're prohibiting every single mandate of any kind for any kind of vaccination in the future. At least that's my understanding. Councillor Lewis, if you'd like to clarify if I'm wrong, please do. All right. Thank you. And uh, I'll just speak to uh, the other bill that was referenced. Uh, I was sponsor of that bill that would have required um, uh, certain uh, public safety employees to be uh, vaccinated. I did withdraw that because I did essentially saw that it did not have support and that this bill would be something to be discussed. But I have a question for staff. Um, would this bill, uh, and maybe it's sponsored well, would this bill prevent the city from requiring testing of its employees if they're not vaccinated? Mr. President, uh, Ms. Kuladon in our office worked on this bill. I'll have her come up to address that question. Ms. Kuladon? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, in its current form, the bill would focus only on uh, requiring vaccination of uh, city employees. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for Ms. Kuladon while she's up there? Seeing, seeing none. All right. Thank you. Um, so we're on the uh, bill as uh, substituted. And uh, if there are no other comments, um, Call upon uh, Council Lewis to close. Mr. President, we're going to give our city employees some peace of mind I think, by doing this, and especially our firefighters and police officers that are, have been working hard um, you know, on the front lines helping people these last few years. And, um, and uh, I, th I think it, this would be, this would be a good, good gift for them. So I urge your support. All right. All those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Opposed? No? To, or five to four, excuse me, let me see. Five to four vote. Um, that uh, then takes us now to other business. And uh, first is approval of the revised committee appointment appointments. I move approval of the revised committee appointments in your iPad. Second from uh, Council Bassan, thank you. And any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed? That passes unanimously. Now we'll move to EC50, the mayor's veto of 022, updating the civil emergency powers ordinance relating to public health order orders. If a councilor wishes to attempt to attempt to attempt over right 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 there's a motion and a second to move to override. Um, I will, uh, uh, if the administration wishes, uh, uh, give them a chance to speak to this. Council President, President Benton, President, members of the council, uh, the uh, mayor's veto, veto message did, did lay out the reasons out why, why the administration, the administration believes that this ability, ability to um, have emergency orders is important. Notably that it was this council that reacted very quickly um, in light of the pandemic to make clear that these powers would be available in the case of a public health emergency. Uh, but just to run through some of the basic um, concepts here, it was uh, the emergency orders did give us the ability to um, expedite procurement, which did things like give us the ability to, to deliver those million meals to um, seniors and so forth. Uh, they, also they also made made virtual, virtual programming, programming um, and, virtual and virtual meetings, meetings possible. So, so did, did also, also made the, the, the continued the functioning of this council, council as well as all of our boards and commissions, commissions um, um, were, were all enabled by, by uh, various emergency, emergency declarations. declarations. 
We were also we're able also to expedite, expedite over $200 million, million dollars in construction projects, which projects really kept our economy afloat in a number of different ways. And we were able, we were to, help able to help a lot of small businesses, businesses by doing by things doing like emergency amendments to leases for city for tenants, tenants and um, helping restaurants uh, operate outdoors by waiving their permit requirements, requirements and fees when indoor dining um, ceased to be an option. So in closing, the, the administration continues to believe that uh, the emergency declaration is an important tool to have in our toolkit in these rare situations of emergency. I know it feels like we've been in emergency for two years because we have been, but uh, in general, <laughs> these events are quite rare and these powers are extraordinary but necessary in those instances. Thank you. All right, thank you, Councilor. Uh, Councilor Lewis. Mr. President, thanks. Ms. Nara, so you recognize that the, the, the council gave those powers to the mayor several years ago and it was the council's idea. My understanding as well it was that the administration wasn't too thrilled about it because of the, uh, the, the just the administrative things and hoops that you had to go through because of it. But you recognize that the, the council gave those powers you know, to the mayor. Council President Benton, uh, Councilor Lewis, the administration has always supported this, including the council's expansion of those powers. I believe we worked with Councilor Davis on that. But you made a, you made a point earlier that that it was the council. That, that did this, and so it wasn't really your idea, it wasn't something that you requested and asked for a few years ago. I think you made that point earlier. Um, but you also recognize that this council, a uh, majority of this council several weeks ago, uh, made the statement, um, clear statement by vote, um, to reverse that. Uh, Council President Benton, Councilor Lewis, yes, that was the vote. Right. And then uh, is, is there anything that specifically you can think of right now um, where you're saying, we need this? You know, we, we need this now because of something specific you can think of right now uh, that you need this ordinance to be able to do what you, you need to do. Uh, Council President Benson, Councilor Lewis, I can think of two off the top of my head. One is the uh, emergency procurement related to the mobile speed enforcement has been um, really important to getting that issue, which became its own sort of pandemic during the pandemic um, across the finish line. In addition, uh, the emergency declaration gives us the ability to um, move along encampments uh, that have that create a public health risk uh, due to overcrowding or potential um, increased risk for infectious diseases. And I know that's an issue in unfortunately in all uh, nine council districts at this point. So those are both continued to be um, enabled by the emergency declaration. Mr. President, and that just for, for Mr. Melindres, the, the two specific things that Ms. Nair mentioned are, is, is that do they not have the ability to be able to do what she just said without these powers given to them? I mean, are there other avenues that they could utilize to be able to, uh, to, be able to act on those two programs? Mr. President and Councilor Lewis, I'm not aware of, of that authority. The way that Ms. Nair uh, referenced it was uh, in relation to public health issues that, that uh, arise from the circumstances she described, uh, essentially encampments. And with respect to that issue, um, this, this I think would be the authority for them to do that. Uh, there are other laws on the books with respect to um, blocking public sidewalks or that type of thing um, in the event that it uh, interferes with the flow of pedestrians or traffic. Um, but to the extent that it's not within those types of locations uh, and it's not a trespass issue that's being enforced by on behalf of a property owner, I'm not aware of another city ordinance. But there are other avenues other than, other than these, these powers. There are other avenues to be able to do those, those two things, including uh, the approval of the council and including the, the administrative um, you know, abilities that they have to be able to, uh, to accomplish those, those two to objectives? Mr. President, Councilor Lewis, let, yes. And if, if I wasn't clear, the, the authority does exist today with respect to public ways and sidewalks and with the ability to uh, enforce trespass issues on private property. To the extent that there are gaps that need to be filled that aren't addressed by those, then it would be within the prerogative of the council to identify a way to deal with that differently and through a separate policy or ordinance. Okay. Councilor Davis. Thank you, Mr. President. We sort of rehashed this a little bit, or we, we went through this a little bit at our, our, our initial vote on this, so I won't, won't bring it up, uh, or won't belabor the point, but I, I do think, and thank you, Ms. Nyer, I think we worked really hard to come up with this um, in the early days of the pandemic. Um, a good, although there are some new counselors that weren't a part of that conversation, 
um, a, a good chunk of us were, and we remember how quickly that information was changing. Um, and we made a very deliberate point, and, and I appreciate that Councillor Lewis has brought this up, and I've heard him speak about it in public, um, that this was different than, the, say, the governor's public declaration powers. Um, this one very specifically balanced, uh, something that we think is very important, found a balance of power so that the mayor can issue the order. There's a, there's a trigger in the law that says if the city council thinks the mayor went too far or doesn't agree, it can convene a hearing and it can uh, change that order or eliminate it altogether, um, both with this new council and the one we had for the last two years. Uh, not in one instance have we found an instance where the council thought it was important enough to go and stop, tell the mayor he went too far. Um, and I think that says a lot. I think it also says a lot that um, that this is more than just one of those, um, although I, I still have my mask here. I see Councilor Feeblecorn uh, has seen it uh, appropriate for her health to wear hers. Um, it's not just a mask mandate. This was how to run the city. It literally allowed us to move staff between departments to do exactly what we talked about. When we needed to deliver senior meals, we didn't have drivers, we talked about this earlier. Um, it gave the mayor the ability to move those people over there without having to convene an emergency city council meeting and reallocate money for that to move those people between line items. Um, running the business of the city is a big deal. And in an emergency and in a crisis, we need our, our leaders, whether we agree with them or not, to have the ability to do what they think is best. And this bill was built in a way that gave this body the ability to come together at any moment and for any whim, as long as five, I think three of us even, if I remember the bill, but a few of us thought they had gone too far. Um, I think it says a lot that we haven't used it, um, and uh, I think it's important in its differences in this, with the state law. And so I think it's important that we keep it. Um, lots of things in the city are still operating under this that keep us going on a daily basis that ensure we're putting our federal dollars, uh, COVID dollars, and local dollars um, into the public health issues that are not yet resolved, including lots of the homelessness issues and others that we're dealing with. So, Mr. President, I, can't, uh, I couldn't support um, Excuse me, I couldn't support uh, an attempts to repeal it the first time, and, uh, and I will work to, to preserve the mayor's veto with this. Councillors, any other comment? Councillor Bassan? Mr. President, I'm, I look forward to getting mobile speed enforcement going. Well played. Um, I look forward to getting mobile speed enforcement going. I don't want to hold that up, but at the same time, I think that we, we do have to do things the right way. I look forward to cleaning up some of the homeless encampments. I have ideas. I want to work with everybody on it. I hope that we can actually implement something very, very soon. I struggle because I certainly don't think that that exists only in an emergency situation. This exists in a very prevalent everyday situation, which is unfortunate for all of us here in Albuquerque, but this is where we're at. And I worry that if we continue to lean on the emergency powers, that that won't be what gets our day-to-day -day stuff done, and we need to start focusing on ways to get that to happen. Um, so that, that's all I have to say right now, because it still was a good one. Councilor Lewis. Mr. President, yeah, I mean, I do respect the fact that I mean, several years ago, the, the council contemplated um, emergencies related to, to COVID and, and so put this put this in place and um, but it, it's pretty sweeping I mean uh, it's very broad very sweeping and this is a this is a strong mayor government I mean where this this uh, in this in this government the mayor has a lot of ability to enact on his own um, and the council has uh, you know your certain authority um, I think in this instance and, and due to the fact that and, and Councilor Davis you mentioned that we haven't used this um, that uh, this is about good government. It's about good checks and balances, good government. And I, I'll just reiterate again that um, by advice and, and uh, by advisories, by recommendations, um, everything that's in, uh, it's, that's in this, that, that bill um, can be done. Um, and so, uh, so I, think, I think it's the appropriate. It's the appropriate. And again, this council, you know, the majority of this council said that this is the right thing to do. Uh, so there is a uh, move to uh, uh, move to override, and uh, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the override of the veto, say yes and raise your hand. Opposed? And that passes unanimously. 
Mr. President, the that fails, excuse me, correct. on a uh, uh, five to four, five to four vote, which will require. All right. There being no further business, the City Council meeting is adjourned.